Dolly, well, hello. Dolly, I don't know if this live stream is going live. You're looking swell. Dolly, I can tell. Hmm. Well, I hope this is working. Ah, good. Someone's in chat. Hello. <clears throat> huh, yes, I'm very professional and I certainly do this for a living. <laughs> Oh good, I'm glad everybody's appreciating the chaos. Uh, let me just, uh, real quick grab that, uh, <laughs> tasty link and, uh, <clears throat> tweet it so people can join in should they so desire. Uh, let's see. Boop. Oh boy, there's everybody. Yeah, I don't know what I was expecting, really. <laughs> There's a few brief seconds after I start the stream when I'm never sure if it's actually working. And it's like, in my head, it's just me in this empty room. But of course, the floodgates are about to open. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Yeah, all right. I'll let y'all get the chaos and, uh, and taters out of your system uh, while uh, we figure out <laughs> what we're going to do tonight. Um, so, uh... <laughs> For those of you who missed the saga on Twitter, I mentioned that I was thinking, you know, could be fun to do a little solo stream. And I was like, I just, you know, I don't know what it would be about. We could we could talk about, like, media. We could talk about tropes. We could do, like, another trope lightning round or something like that. Uh, and then I was like, oh, you know what? Well, if people are giving some good suggestions, we should do a poll. So I, uh, I went to put in a poll. And, of course, I put in uh, chaos or, you know, no kings, no masters, I believe is my exact phrasing, as an option. And obviously it won. So I ended up with even less of a plan than I started with. <laughs> so good job, me. Um, anyway, uh, I have, uh, to keep myself hydrated, I have experimentally created a large pot of some kind of like lemon ginger turmeric tea. I'm not going to lie. It doesn't look like something that humans were meant to consume. Uh, because the turmeric sort of makes it cloudy and yellow. Uh, but, you know, it, it's tea. I guess it's okay. Um, oh yeah, that's not much better than I thought it would be. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, oh boy, yeah, this is, uh, this is a lot. Uh, let's see, what to do. Um, well, traditionally, uh, when we're doing one of these sort of chaos nights, when I don't have anyone else to, uh, rein me in, as it were, uh, I just sort of end up bouncing off the chat uh, with recommendations on what to talk about. And I kind of feel like that's how this was going to go anyway, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> yes, chat, it does bear a, a striking resemblance to certain uh, fluids that are generally meant to go out of the body rather than into it. But it doesn't taste uh, anything similar, so we should be okay. Uh, okay, the first thing I'm seeing in chat is I have not yet seen She-Hulk. Uh, I have seen some people really like She-Hulk, which I think is encouraging. Um, I, uh, I mean, I'm one of those people who, when I saw the trailer and I saw the VFX, I was like, oh, it's nice to know that Marvel and Disney still isn't paying their VFX animators as much as they should be or giving them enough time to make the effects look good. And then everyone's blaming the VFX artists rather than the studios. That's nice. Uh, that was kind of all I needed, but, you know, I'm, I'm really, I, if it's good, that would be fantastic, because I think, uh, She-Hulk has the potential to be a very interesting character, and that would be neat. Oh, boy, um, let's see, <laughs> talk about how awesome Gargoyles was, oh, be still my heart, is it Christmas already? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm just, just seeing a few things oh my god yes okay sorry uh before we talk about whatever that thing i just said was i have seen rrr a friend of mine recommended it for a movie night and it was fantastic oh my god it uh permanently raised the bar in my head for what action movies can and should look like so i don't know if that's like a worthwhile commendation but it's just so fun um definitely do recommend it's very funny because uh when we started watching the movie it has these two like big disclaimers uh and one of them is like while this is set in a historical time period it is not intending to make any sort of statements towards any people or groups living or dead and we were like oh that's a that's a pretty hefty disclaimer wonder why they did that and then the next one was absolutely no animals were harmed in the making of this movie and they listed like several species of animals and we were like that's also oddly specific <laughs> 
And uh, not to spoil, but the movie more than demonstrates why those two disclaimers were considered to be uh, necessary. Um, as I understand it, all the animals in that movie are like VFX, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, because, honestly, they, they look quite good. There's like a couple places where if you're looking for it, you're like, okay, that, that feels a little weird. My brain doesn't quite believe that's in the, in the scene with them. But otherwise, it's fine. Um, and the story is very fun. So, yeah, to my knowledge, it's on Netflix. Uh, so, should you still have that, definitely worth checking it out. Uh, it's, uh, it's very ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba. It's got, like, cartoonishly evil British colonizers in it. So, as soon as they started talking, we were like, oh, so that's why. That's why we needed the disclaimer. Fantastic. Uh, what was the other thing I said I was going to talk about? Uh, it, uh, sorry guys. Uh, oh, gargoyles. That's right. Um, <laughs> well, that one's just self-indulgent. You know, if, if, uh, if people have other things they'd rather I, I talk about, uh, we can certainly do that. But, uh, for those of you who are not aware of, uh, <laughs> Disney's Gargoyles, a cartoon from the 90s, uh, by Disney, though you might not guess that from all the everything, uh, the premise, this was kind of around the time that, like, the Ninja Turtles had gotten really big, and this was sort of the era of, like, not knockoffs, but, oh, we can have a squad of, like, four to seven weirdos uh, that aren't human, but defend humans and have, like, a token human friend, and they probably live in New York, and there were just a bunch of these. And Gargoyles, if you squint, is one of those. Uh, and the gist is that uh, in, like, the year, like, 996, I want to say, uh, a, uh, a Scottish castle is attacked by, like, Viking raiders. Uh, and as the sun sets, all the gargoyles on the castle come to life and repel the invaders. Uh, and then a bunch of other, other stuff happens, and, like, a uh, small number of them end up basically getting frozen in stone. Uh, with the terms of the curse being they will sleep in stone until the castle rises above the clouds, which is a standard, like, impossible uh, curse. You know, if you want the spell to last forever, you give it some sort of... It can only be broken if this impossible thing happens. 1,000 years in the future, extremely bored gazillionaire David Xanatos has the castle painstakingly reconstructed stone by stone on top of his skyscraper, and all the gargoyles come back to life in modern-day New York City. Uh, and then from then on, they, they get up to hijinks and stuff, and it's, it's very fun. Um, Goliath, uh, the main gargoyle, has just the best voice. Like, when I try and make people watch this show, I'm like, look, I know it's not gonna make sense for the first five minutes, but just trust me, and I only have to force them for, like, <laughs> the first few minutes, because as soon as Goliath talks, they're like, all right, I listen to him read the phone book, so I'm sold, and that's great. Um, excuse me, I see someone sh spamming in chat, hoping I wouldn't notice. You devious little trickster, you. Pardon me while I smite thee. <clears throat> there you go. I hope you've learned your lesson. Anyway, uh, let's see. Right, so uh, Gargoyles is quite good with caveats. Uh, there are things about Gargoyles that are silly. It is not absolutely flawless, obviously. Uh, it also came out in the 90s, and it has a sort of sci-fi vibe but sci-fi for the 90s so like in the first few episodes they like <laughs> they attack these like shield style helicarriers to retrieve information stored on floppy disks so you know it's got that kind of slight weirdness season two has some very odd pacing stuff like a lot of it takes place when they're sort of just hopping across the timeline uh, and it goes on maybe twice as long as it really needed to before they get back and everything's normal again. Uh, and it's one of those shows with a final season that you probably just shouldn't watch. <laughs> um, so anyway, but uh, it, it is very cool. Uh, there's a lot of interesting Shakespearean references in it. Uh, the actual historical Macbeth is like a recurring character. Uh, he, he was rendered immortal in the backstory of the show. It's fine, whatever. He's cool. He's got a great accent. It's very fun to listen to. Um, Oberon and Titania and Puck are all recurring secondary sort of antagonists. Anyway, it's cool. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, and a ton of Star Trek TNG actors are in Gargoyles, and they all give such better performances than they do in TNG. Uh, Xanatos is voiced by Jonathan Frakes, Riker, uh, and gives more emotion in every single one of his lines as Xanatos than he ever does for, like, the first four seasons of TNG. And Marina Sirtis 
plays uh, Demona, possibly the most interesting character and villain in the show. And obviously, Deanna Troy doesn't really ever get to emote, other than being like, Captain, I'm sensing hostility, so, you know, whatever. Uh, but as Demona, she gets to really show off, and it's just so fun. Um, I think the only main TNG actor they don't get is Patrick Stewart, probably because he was way too expensive. But, like, even Brent Spiner, uh, he plays Puck, and he does a really good job. So just for that, I think it's worth checking it out. And I, I watched it in, like, the reverse order for most people. I watched Gargoyles before I really sat down and watched a lot of Star Trek The Next Generation. So for me, it was just a categorical downgrade. <laughs> Everyone sounds so much flatter in DNG than they do in Gargoyles. Anyway, I think I've, uh, I've run that. Uh, does Gargoyles have a movie? I don't think Gargoyles has a movie. That might be for the best, but... Um, Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, Patrick Stewart was not Macbeth. It, uh, well, I mean, he played Macbeth in a movie, but he wasn't Macbeth in Gargoyles, uh, which is fine. <laughs> Please discuss Reboot or Steven Universe. Guys, it's cruel. It is cruel to ask me to discuss Reboot because I will, but nobody will be able to stop me because the problem is when I get two in the zone, I stop being able to read the chat. And thus, I will not be able to see your lamentations, your pleas for mercy. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, okay, I guess I can talk about Reboot. I mean, it would be it would be helpful to have, like, specifics on what you want me to talk about with regards to Reboot. There's a lot there. Um, uh, but I could talk about Sandman first, because I saw a couple of you bringing that up. I think we talked about it when Blue and I streamed the other day. Uh, but I really liked the Netflix Sandman show. Um... Which is interesting because I uh, read the Sandman comics a while back and I thought they were very interesting uh, and I got a lot out of them. But I had this problem with them that I've, I've discussed before, which is that a lot of Neil Gaiman stories sort of don't quite grab me on a character level. Um, excuse me. And it's no like shade to the man. He's a great writer. He has a lot of very fascinating ideas. I love the way he conceives of gods and world build stuff and just draws all these things together. Uh, but in my experience, a lot of his stories sort of have the characters as, like, these very just sort of emotionless, flat POV figures for the audience to observe this interesting world through. Uh, and the most interesting characters tend to be secondary or tertiary. Um, so, like, Odin and Loki are the most interesting parts of American gods, not Shadow Moon, the nominal protagonist, stuff like that. And one thing I hoped that they would do with Sandman is what they did with Good Omens, which is that they uh, basically let the actors really spice up the characters and sort of give them <laughs> personalities and character traits that I could actually get invested in. Because uh, I really liked what they did with Go Good Omens, which for a collaboration between two authors I really loved, I couldn't really get into before the show version. Like, I'd read it, but I didn't really get it. And then with this, I was like, oh, I get it. Um... And they did that with Sandman, and I thought that was very cool. But I went into Sandman with, from the perspective of, I've read all of the comics, like, so many times. I'm curious to see what they've changed and what they've improved. Austin, the DM of Rolling with Difficulty, has also seen Sandman, and he was not as impressed uh, because of various pacing issues. Characters would be introduced and then go nowhere. Like, things that were objectively comedic concepts would be dropped and then sort of never pay off. Which is all stuff from the comics that I had just sort of, you know, written off as like, well, yes, that's just how it goes. If anything, they dramatically improved it by stitching it all together much better. Uh... So it was very cool. Like, I, I'm not sure I can promise that if you haven't read the comic, you'll love the show. Uh, but if you have read the comic, I think the show is just very interesting to watch pretty much no matter what. Um, how to explain? I saw a couple people be like, the fuck is up with Sandman? So how to explain this? Um, the core conceit of the universe of Sandman is that there are these seven beings that are beyond gods. They are basically concepts and they have existed for as long as there have been thinking living beings in the universe, and they will exist until there are no more thinking living beings in the universe. And each of them sort of governs a realm or a concept. Like, they, they're a personification of the concept, and they also govern a, a realm that's sort of physical and sort of metaphorical that maps to that concept. So, they are the Endless. They all have names that start with D. Uh, the main one that we focus on in Sandman is Dream. Dream of the Endless. He is also called Morpheus. That's his name. He is Dream. He is Morpheus. Whatever. Uh, there are others. Uh, there's Destiny, Death, Desire, Despair, Delirium, Dream, and Destruction. Um, 
And they have a very complicated family dynamic and relationship and stuff. Uh, now, the key problem <laughs> that a lot of people have with Sandman is that the main character is this, like, semi-omnipotent, immortal, omniscient super being with basically no weaknesses. <laughs> and after the first arc of the comics, when he's kind of depowered and vulnerable, he's pretty much indestructible and super badass for the entire rest of the arc right up until the final arc. Which is not what you would be told to do in a writing class. Doesn't mean it's wrong, does mean it's tricky. Uh, and so most of the later stories in Sandman sort of focus on characters that aren't Morpheus, uh, that like, you know, they go on adventures or they have weird things in their dreams and Morpheus almost shows up as like a glorified cameo, like right at the end. Uh, and the show does a lot of heavy lifting to, uh, make that not as much of a thing, <laughs> like letting the characters interact and have dynamics before that, which is just, I, in my opinion, unconditional improvement. Just like absolutely so much more fun to watch when you actually sort of feel like the characters care about each other and matter more than just like in this one moment on the page. Uh, I feel like Sandman is one of those adaptations that, again, I said this on the stream the other day, I don't want to like retread too much, but Sandman is one of those stories that treats the original version like a first draft. And then when they're approaching it for the adaptation, they're like, okay, what can we tighten up? What can we fix? What can we change with the times? You know, it's been like 35 years, we can make this a little bit better, you know, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> let me have some of this gross turmeric tea real quick. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, one funny thing about Sandman is it's technically in the DC universe, uh, although they, they filed off all the serial numbers for the Sandman show, and I, honestly, I like that. Uh, Mo Neil Gaiman's work really kind of works best when it feels like urban fantasy, and the problem is when you layer urban fantasy on top of the DC universe, where, like, aliens exist, and Batman's just hanging around, it makes it a little bit less like, oh, how cool, another world layered directly on top of our own. Because you kind of have to suspend your disbelief and be like, and also Batman's there. Um, <clears throat> so, like, the first arc of the comic that was adapted into the first several episodes of the show, uh, the villain is John D., Dr. Destiny. Like, th that episode of Justice League I keep using as an example where all the leaguers are trapped in their nightmares by this bad guy. That's the guy. Like, that's the main bad guy from, <laughs> from the first arc of Sandman. Uh, but they filed off all those serial numbers. Now he's just John D., which I think is ultimately a good change. It allows him to have a personality more than just he's evil, so obviously he's going to be evil. Um, and then, like, in the first arc of the comic, I think there's even a bit where, like, he he meets the Martian Manhunter, and it's sort of the first time we see that Morpheus's form is extremely flexible, and he sort of appears as different things to different people. Because, of course, Martian Manhunter's an alien. Their culture has a completely different version of Dream of the Endless. Uh, so he appears as this, like, silhouetted Martian-shaped being just surrounded by fire, uh, which is kind of a dick move because, you know, Martian's very fire-averse. Anyway... Lots of cool stuff that I'm not sorry they cut from the show. I think it works a lot better on its own. And, and the comic dropped a lot of the DC stuff as quickly as possible and sort of tried to make it its own thing as much as possible, which I think was the good call. And the show, as part of that, uh, swapped out the character of John Constantine for a different Constantine. There is, of course, a large Constantine family in the comics. Um, <clears throat> In the comics, Dream at one point in like the 1700s encountered Joanna Constantine, a distant ancestress of the John Constantine of DC Comics, and then he runs into John Constantine in the present and he helps him get his sand back, etc., etc. So in the show, as part of the filing off the DC serial numbers, they swapped off John Constantine for another Joanna Constantine. Uh, and I really liked her. I thought she was great. I think that actress is really good in everything she does, and uh, it was cool. So I like the show. I can't promise you'll like the show. But just from a writing standpoint, like a lost in adaptation thing, it's so interesting. Oh, boy. Uh, all right. <laughs> when it's just me on the stream, I really got to remember that, like, I need to breathe. <laughs> it's stuff like that. Okay. Uh, do I have any thoughts on Epithet Erased? I keep seeing Epithet Erased popping up. Yeah, I liked Epithet Erased. Uh, I'm excited for more of it, but I know it's going to take a while because... Uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, Jell Apocalypse is basically animating by himself, <laughs> so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while, but I thought it was really cool and I liked it. Um, 
What do I think about the controversial news that Warner Bros. Discovery is canceling a bunch of shows as well as removing the shows from HBO Max? Uh, I think it's dumb. I don't think anyone needs me to say that. Uh, I, HBO Max has been extremely convenient to me for a while, but <sighs> the problem is ever since these like companies kind of figured out they could just make their own streaming service and then put all their stuff on that streaming service and make people pay only them money for it. Uh, we've just rediscovered the days of, you know, cable where everything is way too granular and everyone's basically going to be like, well, I'm not going to pay for every one of these. So I'm going to pick like one or two and then none of the rest of you get any money. Uh, so it's a dumb decision. I can see why they're making it. Uh, I don't think it's going to do them any good in the long run. And I kind of hope this is maybe the thing that makes all the animators snap, you know, because like modern co uh, cartoon animation is so thankless. <laughs> Uh, and I've just been seeing, you know, need new deal for animation, the stuff like that trends, you know, every few months. And I'm, I'm just kind of hoping that we're going to get like some real proper, like, I don't know, union activity of like, all right, you know what? I've had enough. We, we pour hours and, you know, weeks and months of our lives into these shows that then get canned and seasons are never aired. And like, where's the respect? And it's like, I, obviously I wish they would just stop doing this stuff. But if this is the thing that like tips the animation industry over the edge into like becoming a true force in nature and making these guys not able to do that anymore, I think that would be good. But, you know, <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, let's see. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> have I seen Sandman? Yes, we just, we just covered Sandman. Uh, it's, it's back in the VOD. You'll watch it later. Uh, when is OSP coming out with their streaming service? You know, I know some YouTube channels that have tried that, uh, and there's a reason we don't want to do that. <laughs> I like being on YouTube, and I like being able to bounce between different channels, that, you know, more discovery and stuff like that. Um, Iron Widow keeps popping up. Um, I really liked it. I read it a while back, um, and it's fun. Uh, for those of you who haven't, it's, uh, sort of... Well, it's described as uh, Pacific Rim meets The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, giant robots versus sort of robot aliens, sort of. There's a lot of twists about it I don't want to spoil. Um, but it's also heavily derived from Chinese history and mythology. It's got a great aesthetic. Uh, the author uh, is very cool. They have a YouTube channel, talks about various elements of uh, Chinese history and stuff like that. So uh, worth checking out. Uh, Jiran Jie Zhao. I hope I'm saying that name in a halfway Googleable way. So if you're curious about that, do check it out. And I'm excited for the sequel. Um, I keep seeing Song of Achilles crop up. I haven't read it. Blue has, I think. Said he liked it, if I recall correctly. I just haven't. I Okay, I've seen stuff about Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. R-O-T-T-M-N-T. Uh... And I haven't watched it, uh, and the reason I haven't watched it is because I've seen some clips, and the animation for, like, the action sequences is absolutely beautiful, but the animation is, like, always so much, you know? <laughs> and, like, the characters are always so much, and it's just, it's a little, I don't know, <laughs> it feels to me like the cartoon equivalent of a really sugary breakfast cereal, like, I need to be really in the right mindset for that, and I am not. So I haven't watched it, but I've seen some stuff about it. The people who like it seem to really like it, so I'm sure it's doing something right. Also, they make Raph the leader, and I don't know if I like that on principle. I, I like him as the Lancer too much, so... Anyway, um... Uh... Paranatural. Paranatural's good. Uh, it's a webcomic. They're currently doing, um... It's not really in comic form. It's, like, sort of written out as prose with illustrations, which is much faster than uh, publishing them as comic pages, but I uh, I like it better as the comic. I completely understand why it's doing it this way. It's just, it's not, doesn't quite work for me, but I highly recommend reading through the archive. It's incredibly cool. Um, hmm. <laughs> yes, they put the angry one in charge, but that makes me think that he's probably not the angry one anymore, and I don't really know how I feel about that. Uh, oh boy. Oh no, it's flying again. Uh, I can talk about the Owl House again, but like I've I've talked about how it's good and everybody should watch it and it deserves more episodes and circle back to my previous thing about animators of the world unite, etc., etc., etc. 
Oh, boy. Uh, you guys need to come to some kind of consensus here, man. <laughs> um, what? Why is Raph not angry anymore? That's just wrong. Like, oh, they made him a himbo? Of course they made him a himbo. Where's Indigo when you, when you really need her? <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever heard Indigo's full um, stop himboifying my angry red-themed Lancers monologue. Uh, it's it's a sight to behold. I, I won't spoil the, the details. But... Uh, it is a pattern that I've observed uh, that uh, that angry lancers are more of like a mid to late 2000s, 2010s kind of trend. And recent remakes, you know, your Sonic booms and stuff like that are like, we're going to take the character whose previous characterization was they're angry and they like butt heads with the hero and make them cheerful and stupid. And it's like, all right, those are two completely different characters. But that's okay. Anyway, um... Oh, boy. <laughs> the himbo epidemic, yes. Uh, do I have a favorite guilty pleasure trope? One that is ordinarily bad, but sometimes works for me. That's an interesting one. Um, I think I sort of stopped buying into the concept of guilty pleasures a while ago because it's like, if you like something and you consider it a guilty pleasure, it's because somebody made you feel bad about liking something, and I just don't think that's great, and it's probably not something you need to use to caveat your own tastes and things, of like, oh, yeah, this is something I like, but someone somewhere sometime guilted me about it, so now I have to call it a guilty pleasure. Like, it's just shit you like, you know? There are plenty of tropes that I think are bad a lot of the time, but also sometimes they're very fun. Um, I am, I've talked about, like, I'm a huge fan of the old I know you're in there somewhere fight, uh, and it's a source, uh, it's associated, like, corollary tropes of, like, oh, the character's, like, mind-controlled, but I'm gonna, like, hug them, and they're gonna snap out of it rather than hurt the person they care about, and it's like, yeah, it's good stuff, but also, there's, like, a lot of times that overlaps with romantic subplots, and it's like, do I like a romantic subplot where one of them might turn evil and try and murder the other one? I don't think that's great so much. So, you know, there's there's a lot of tropes where it's, like, really all in the execution. Um, what? Excuse me. Please hold while somebody suffers. Boop. Okay. <clears throat> Everyone stop talking about Percy Jackson. I've already talked about Percy Jackson so much. Uh, have I watched The Legend of Vox Machina? I have! I liked it. It's also in the category of things that I think treated the original as a first draft and then successfully pulled off, uh, an adaptation by treating it like a second draft. I thought it was really good. Um, let's see. <laughs> have I ever seen or heard of Lego Monkey Kid? I have! I've actually talked about this. Uh, Lego Monkey Kid is extremely cool, uh, and I've had trouble making myself watch it because it is too close to this thing that holds so much like bandwidth in my head uh it i i almost have to stay it's like two magnets with the same charge like repelling each other i almost have to stay away from it in case like its version supersedes the one in my head and like i stop having original ideas about how to do journey to the west uh, but i've known about it since it was first announced because we uh, i brag about this so much it's so nothing but i'm still so happy it happened we got an email from one of the guys who worked on it who was like hey we got this new show coming out and we super definitely watched some of your Journey to the West videos to prep for it. And it was just the most baffling moment of like, you what? How is that a thing? I'm just messing around. I'm just some Dumbo on the internet. But anyway, um, let's see. <laughs> Muppet Treasure Island. I have gone on the record that I believe the world would be a better place if we got more movies like Muppet Treasure Island, you know, like that, it was that meme going around of like, wh what movie would you do, you know, the Muppet Treasure Island or the Muppet Christmas Carol treatment for? And I think that meme was so big because we only ever got those two. Like there are other Muppet movies, but they're not the same, you know, and and those two were really the standouts. Like the other Muppet movies are just like, they're almost like, I don't know, uh, like workplace comedies, but everyone's a puppet. And that's fine if you like workplace comedies, but I like treasure island and a christmas carol <laughs> and i think i like them more when there are muppets involved so I, there's a lot of stories i think would be greatly improved by various uh muppets 
playing out the entire secondary and in some cases primary cast and the other thing i like about muppet treasure island and muppet christmas carol is that their uh their human stars took entirely opposing approaches to it um what i like about muppet christmas carol is that uh the the scrooge in that movie is like i'm going to be playing like this like it's the royal shakespeare company and none of you are puppets and then there's tim curry in muppet treasure island who basically is a muppet like actually and is just having so much fun chewing the scenery and it's just an absolute delight so yes that is the absolute best treasure island adaptation uh I like Treasure Planet as much as anyone, but it cannot beat Muppet Treasure Island, uh, which also just has banging musical numbers, which is another advantage. Um, yeah, so super good. Uh, let's see. Jujutsu Kaisen. I've seen Jujutsu Kaisen pop up a lot. Um, I watched like the first 22 episodes of it when it first came out, and I thought it was fine. Uh, I looked into what it was doing in the manga, learned it was going to some very dark and upsetting places, and decided I didn't want to read it. So that's basically it. I thought it was cool, and then it got to a point where I didn't like it anymore, so I tapped out. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Muppet Iliad. I would love a Muppet Iliad. Especially because, like, oh man. I'm just, the first place my mind went is, like, when Hector is dead <laughs> and getting, like, dragged along behind Achilles' chariot. He's, it's just like the Muppet, but with no hand in it. <laughs> so it's just all floppy and weird and deflated. They're like, ah, the grace of the gods is protecting his body from harm. Oh, boy. Um, I mean, if, look, if we're doing the Muppet Iliad, Miss Piggy has to be Helen of Troy. She would accept no other casting. I mean, that's the only way to make it work. Uh, I guess the question is, is Kermit Parrot or is Ker uh, Parrot? <laughs> is Kermit Paris or is Kermit Menelaus or is Kermit Achilles? Like, if we're doing the 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 Kermit and Miss Piggy dynamic, I think, you know, it's got to be Paris or Menelaus. But, you know, Kermit is kind of a leading man, so it would work in either way. Um, and we could do Link Hogthrob as uh, Agamemnon. I tend to cast him as the, the sort of dickhead authority figures in um in the various muppet adaptations i imagine in a better universe would exist uh muppet Macbeth would be pretty great too i can actually <laughs> i can see the dagger scene in my head with like a dagger very transparently on strings like bobbing along it might even have eyes <laughs> and like a mouth and it's got a musical number oh no uh animal as achilles would be pretty pretty good and i really like the gonzo is odysseus vibe um especially because then we can theoretically get the muppet odyssey sequel which is just all about gonzo and of course we need rizzo as like the only other person who keeps surviving all the shipwrecks all right this is really working for me i think we've got something here <laughs> oh boy uh honestly kermit agamemnon it's been decades let him branch out artistically that's fair i think we we underestimate kermit as an actor i think we we let our awareness uh, our awareness of his true personality color our perspectives on what roles he can play but he's a talented you know thespian i think he'd totally be able to pull off agamemnon um but who's the only human that's my question uh i mean you know the nominal main character of the Iliad is Achilles. Uh, it is mostly all about him. Uh, and the problem is if we hadn't already cast Miss Piggy as Helen of Troy, it would make sense for Helen to be the only human because that, that almost feels like a thing that they just do on a regular episode of The Muppet Show. Like, they'd have the very special guest star like Rita Moreno or something like that and then it'd be like, oh, that's the beautiful Helen who faced a lost her thousand ships and then they all just like, you know... <laughs> You do a standard Muppet fight where one of them, like, something explodes and one of the Muppets just gets flung bodily into frame and then falls out of it again. Uh, human Cassandra? Oh my god. Yes, okay, sorry. Sold. Cassandra's the only human in the entire movie. <laughs> She's the only one who sees it for what it truly is. Okay. We got it. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Uh, Miss Piggy would also work as Aphrodite, but I honestly think the only way this could possibly work out is that Miss Piggy is double cast as both Helen and Aphrodite, and she just, like, transparently shows up as, like, a green screen against herself in, like, an increasingly more elaborate outfit. Uh, all right. 
We got it. Good work, team. We could also do it so that all the gods are humans and all the, like, mortals are Muppets. Uh, I think that would also work, but I think Cassandra is the only human is too funny to pass up, and we absolutely must have this. Um, and yes, uh, obviously, Gonzo is Odysseus, but Rizzo is just himself, like, in A Christmas Carol. Uh, or... <laughs> <laughs> or Rizzo is playing the role of Athena, <laughs> constantly guiding and helping out Odysseus. Oh, there's too many options. Um, oh, no. Uh, the Gods as Muppets is also kind of funny. I feel like we wouldn't want to miss that opportunity. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Muppet alien Muppet thing. I feel like I've already seen those discussed. Uh, anyway, uh... Let's see. Oh, Rizzo as uh, the guy who took out Ares, Diomedes. Rizzo as Diomedes. I think that would be pretty good. Um, oh, boy. All right. We got to move on from this Muppet thing, or that's going to be the only thing I talk about. <laughs> um, Sam the Eagle as Zeus is really inspired casting, but we got to move on, guys. <laughs> we can't stay on this forever. Oh my god, I, I keep forgetting the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance happened. I watched that entire show, and then I heard they were canceling it after one season, and I was like, oh, okay, and then I just mentally purged it from my memory banks. Um, I think because it it was kind of like promising the same thing that um, uh, Age of Calamity was, which is, this is going to be the story where all the good guys like lose and die, and then that leads into the story we're familiar with, where it starts from the position of, all the good guys are dead except for like two of them total and now we're going to unpack how how that happens so you know one of those um star wars prequel style tragedies that where it's like you know from the beginning they're all going to die and like how's that going to happen um and of course age of calamity was like swerve this was an alternate timeline the whole time and everyone's going to be alive and it's like oh well that's uh good for them i guess cool uh and then with age of uh, with age of resistance it was like oh yeah yeah, we, we had a season, and they had, like, a like a temporary, like, a victory that obviously wasn't going to last, but, like, oh, they're all amped, and it's like, good as triumphed, and then they just canceled the show. So it's like, all right, good work, team. I guess we've successfully prevented the timeline where the Dark Crystal movie is ever made. <laughs> uh, anyway. And it's funny, because when I watch the show, um, this is, here's the thing. I have only respect for... Jim Henson's Muppets, I, I have only respect for the creature shop and all that stuff. I think Dark Crystal is an incredibly ambitious and very beautiful movie, but I also think that sometimes the fact that they're puppets is a little bit silly. Um, and when I watched Age of Resistance, I was like, oh man, you know, this is really impressive, but like, man, I, whenever I remember that they're puppets, I'm like, oh yep, yeah, that's a puppet. These are two puppets having a sword fight. And then... <laughs> I went back and watched, like, a few clips from the original Dark Crystal, and I was like, ooh, these puppets look worse than the ones I just saw. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, no shade. I mean, the technology's evolved so much since then, but I felt bad being like, oh, no. Oh, no, the effects. Oi. Okay. Um... Ah, see a comment about Moby Dick. Actually, one of the only ridiculously time-consuming classics I never had to read for class. I probably will someday, but I have not yet read Moby Dick. So, I mean, I know the memes, obviously, but everybody does. Uh, oh, jeez, oh, jeez. Uh, have I seen Harley Quinn, the animated show? I actually haven't, but I did read <laughs> the comic run they put between seasons two and three. I don't know why that's the only thing I read. I think, what was it? Um... I think it was recommended off of, I want to make sure I get this channel recommendation right. I think I've already, uh, just a second. Um, is this the, no, hold on. I'm thinking of the wrong one. Sorry. There's a video about, uh, Harley Quinn and Ivy's relationship. Uh, and it was really good. And it mentioned that the comic run, yeah, it's by Lady Emily, uh, so I, I've already recommended that somewhere. I'm going to recommend it again. The video is great. Uh, but basically, it the video mentioned that, like, there was some pretty cool stuff in the comic run. And, like, that comic run is one of the only ones where they are explicitly, actually in a relationship and stay that way. Uh, so I read through it. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. But if this is the sense of humor that the entire cartoon has, I think I'm good. So that was just kind of my vibe. Uh, let's see. Hmm, 
we are starting to I'm starting to see some repetition uh and some very good Muppet pitches in the comments um oh no every as soon as I slow down chat speeds up I only have like a few seconds to like look at the chat with any sort of coherence before it, it just spirals out of control again uh let's see Dota okay so my only experience with Dota is that show they did you know Dota Dragon's Blood and I only saw the first season because that was what was out when I watched it uh and I've I when I checked Netflix the other day I was like oh they made two more seasons of that neat and I just haven't watched it yet uh, I thought it was pretty cool <laughs> but it definitely had big sort of like everyone's a main character energy where like everyone kind of has their own thing going on uh it's kind of what Arcane managed to avoid by sort of making all the characters feel grounded in the same like universe with the same rules and with Dota, it's like, even though they are grounded in the same universe with the same rules, everyone really feels like a protagonist of a completely separate narrative than everybody else. Um, guys, bringing up MASH more times with more question marks is not going to make me have magically watched it. Sorry. Um, Umbrella Academy. I, okay. I watched, like, the first two seasons of Umbrella Academy, and I thought it was really interesting but it also catalyzed this thesis I have, which is that as soon as a story introduces a timeline reset or a multiverse, it immediately loses me on a very real level. <laughs> uh, because essentially, when you have a story with only one timeline, you know, like a regular linear plot that goes from point A to point B, then essentially what this does is it lets you get invested in the characters but it also lets you get invested in the world the events of the plot the secondary characters all that stuff but then if for instance you do something like they did in like the cw flash i want to say season two or something the first time they flash pointed um and suddenly you've introduced a second timeline not as separate not something the characters can travel between but like oh we've reset something we've changed the past and now the future is different uh, well, now the audience can't really get invested in anything outside the one character or set of characters that can travel in time and thus aren't changed when the time stream shifts or whatever. So now the entire world is sort of fluid and flexible and every secondary character, everyone who's not in the in-group of people who get to, you know, stay the same... They're not, you can't get invested because they can change out from under you at literally any time. And that makes it very difficult to stay invested in the story because that kind of means you need to be invested in only the characters that are preserved from loop to loop. The problem I had with Umbrella Academy is that all the main characters are assholes and like they are really slow to improve. <laughs> so I wasn't really able to get invested in them within the first couple seasons and now that they're resetting stuff again i'm like all right well call me when you get that sorted out i guess but until then i'm just gonna be over here <laughs> you know reading stories that don't do this every season finale um so that's i mean what that really means is that i am not the target audience for that <laughs> if i'm if you don't enjoy that sort of season finale reset time loop what's the universe look like this time thing then I cannot see how you could enjoy Umbrella Academy. Uh, it is similar to the All a Dream problem. It is, uh, it's also the biggest problem I had with the back half of Bioshock Infinite once it became very clear that, like, none of these timelines matter at all. We're just going to go from here to another one. Uh, it just sort of, it, it dramatically diminishes audience investment because it shrinks the space of things that an audience can care about from the entire cast and setting to, like, just the in-group. And, uh, if you're not really into the in-group, you're, uh, you're not gonna really vibe with it. So, that's, a that's a sneak preview of a detailed diatribe I'm gonna sit blue down for one of these weeks. Uh, we, we've, <laughs> we had a discussion about this, where it's like, as soon as it introduces a multiverse, doesn't it, like, doesn't it really make it all kind of not good anymore? What's up with that? And so, um... Yeah, that's another reason why I think everyone, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a really good movie because it's one of the only stories that, like, introduces the multiverse and then actively acknowledges, like, hey, this kind of makes it seem like it's impossible to get invested in anything that happens in the here and now because there's a universe right next door where it didn't happen. 
And that's the point. And then the movie was incredible and everybody should watch it. Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Metal Gear. Um, just gonna drink some of this gross turmeric tea again. Okay, here we go. It is taking me so long to get through this tiny, like, shot glass-sized cup of tea. Oh, I'll get there eventually. Um... Favorite Discworld book? Oh, you shouldn't have. Uh, it's Thud. Uh, but it takes a while to get there <laughs> and why it's that good. Um, so this is a good opportunity for me to pitch why everybody should read a bunch of Discworld books. Uh, so, uh, as I've gone on record saying before, uh, if you are trying to start the Discworld series, you should start with Guards, Guards. Um, it's really good, but the main thing about the Discworld series is there's like 40 books in it. And it's sort of subdivided into a lot of series uh, that mostly focus on specific characters within those series. Uh, and the first two Discworld books are The Color of Magic and The Light Fantastic. And they're fine, but don't read them first. <laughs> um, they, I mean, when Terry Pratchett started the Discworld series, it was such... It was a joke. It was, uh, it was a send-up of the fantasy tropes that were common at the time. Uh, so a lot of his early books are about, like... This is a wizard, but he's not, like, one of those cool wizards. He's, like, a loser wizard. Uh, or, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we introduced the concept of an insurance salesman into this fantasy universe? Or, uh, you know, oh, we've got, uh, we've got this guy, this barbarian hero, but he's been at it for so long that he's a really old man, but he's still a real badass, because otherwise you don't live very long as an adventurer. That's funny. And it's like, yeah, it is funny. But, you know, is it, like, sell an entire premise of a book funny? And I think the first series of books he kind of started doing, like, some of the earliest characters he planted were the uh, the witches in Weird Sisters and the character of Death. He has an anthropomorphic personification of Death, who is great. Death is fantastic. Um, and Weird Sisters is early enough that when I reread it, I was like, this is a little weird. Death is even earlier. He shows up in a uh, couple books that are so early that it's easy to sort of forget they were even there. One of them being Mort. Uh, which is about Mort, the apprentice of death. Uh, and Mort ends up developing a romance with death's adoptive daughter, and they have a daughter, Susan, and Susan is the main character of several books down the line. And Susan is great, but don't start with her books because they require much more context than the others. And the witches are kind of the same thing. The first book they're in, Weird Sisters, is like a total, it's like an inversion of Macbeth, basically. It's like the plot of Macbeth happens, but we're watching it from the perspective of the witches. Uh... Which is cool. It's a cool concept. But it's kind of niche. Which is why you should start with Guards Guards. Guards Guards is really good. And it kicks off the Guards novels. Which starts with sort of a little trilogy. Um, and then just kind of keeps going. Uh, and it is a fantasy police procedural. Which I adore. Uh, every book is basically a murder mystery or something similar. And it starts with, again... A fantasy joke, a joke of a trope from fantasy literature that was popular at the time, which is that city guards are useless. Like, they're, they are the cannon fodder that the heroes will, like, knock out and steal the uniforms of, or be locked up in jail and then steal the keys and then escape from, etc., etc. Um, you know, they're, they're just basically faceless mooks. So the main character of Guards Guards, v Samuel Vimes, is the captain of the guard, of the Night Watch, the guards who only exist to get mugged, and, like, ignored, and all that stuff. And, well, I, a while back, I streamed, like, reading a decent chunk of the book before I did enough Googling to figure out that uh, producing what amounts to an unlicensed audiobook is kind of illegal, <laughs> so I had to stop, because I, like, emailed the Pratchett Estate and was like, is it okay if I do this? And they didn't respond, which doesn't mean yes. So anyway, um... Uh, the thing that kind of shifts the watch around is this uh, this guy shows up, Captain Carrot, and I see someone in chat who knows what's up, uh, who basically just, well, he's not a captain yet, but he, he shows up to enlist in the watch, uh, and it becomes very clear over the course of the story and the subsequent ones that Carrot is the true king of Hank Morpork. Uh, he's like an orphan with a birth sh birthmark shaped like a crown and an ancestral sword, and he was found in, like, a wrecked carriage with everybody dead and, like, raised 
by uh, a happy family that happened to be dwarves in a mine. And then they were like, it's time for you to go off and seek your fortune. And he decides, well, I feel like I'm really, really just like precision crafted to serve the people. <laughs> so he goes and becomes a guard. And everyone's like, what? But he's like, the Discworld is a universe that is like canonically kind of fictional. And the rules of reality sort of adhere to the rules of tropes and fiction. So the fact that he is the true king of Ankh-Morpork means that things kind of just work out around him. Like everybody likes him on a level they don't understand. And society kind of works better around him. It's really unnerving. But the main character, Vimes does not trust any of this at all. He trusts Carrot because Carrot is as honest as they come, but he doesn't trust the narrative weirdness that happens around Carrot. Uh, and there's this sort of complex, like, Triforce power play going on in the city between Carrot, who's kind of actually in charge, and Lord Vetinari, the tyrant ruler of the city who has all the trappings of being a stock evil villain, but isn't actually evil and is actually keeping the city running great, and Vimes, who basically Carrot and Vetinari are both using to keep them, like honest and in check which is just fantastic it's such a fun characterization and that's just like established in the first book and then there's more so guards guards is kind of his low point and then after that in every subsequent book vimes keeps getting like promotions and like money and titles and he hates all of it it really confuses him but really it's just vetinari like leveling him up so he can hold more and more powerful people accountable um so by men at arms, uh, he's already sort of in charge and the watch is already sort of getting reformed and people are taking it seriously. Uh, and the threat in men at arms is... So the threat in guards guards is basically a bunch of nutters summon a dragon uh, in the hopes of, I guess, getting the true king back to slay the dragon. Obviously, the dragon kills the guy they get and then takes over the city. And then I think they try to arrest him. It's been a while since I read it, but it's really good. Uh, in men at arms, the threat is a gun. Like... Gun technology doesn't exist in the Discworld. It's sort of like a viral meme that infiltrates the universe from outside and starts sort of warping reality around it. It's got one of the best characterizations of Paragon heroes in a moment where, uh, basically, <laughs> so the, the gun sort of mentally takes people over. It's, again, viral memes. This is a thing that happens in a lot of Discworld books. In one of the books, it's a shopping mall that does that. It's a lot of stuff. It, it feels like it should be some, like, weird boomer, like, kids these days shit. But, like, it somehow it isn't. So that's good. Uh, but basically, Captain Carrot is too pure of heart. He's just completely immune to the effect of the gun. And when the guy, like, you know, he, like, picks it up and just, like, breaks it, I think. And is like, oh, that's weird. Okay. Anyway, um, in Feet of Clay... Uh, the, it's a murder mystery that is also, uh, one of the only fictional analogies for Jewish people I've ever seen that worked really well. Uh, and it's about basically golems advocating for their right to self-determination and personhood. So that's good. Um, and then I believe there's the, <laughs> the fifth elephant, which is a little hard to explain. There's werewolves. And then there's Thud which was a very long way to get to Thud being my favorite Discworld novel. <laughs> um, by the time of Thud, Sir Samuel Vimes is a sir now. He has a wife who he loves very much, and he has a young son. Uh, and having a son is kind of playing merry hell with his emotional stability because uh, it really, really, really scares him that something bad could happen to him. Uh, but it's also about this like complex political conflict between trolls and dwarves because, again... Something that Terry Pratchett unpa- Oh, I forgot about Jingo. Sorry. Jingo is also in there, which is very basically like, hey, doesn't it suck when, like, uh, <laughs> people in charge of armies make the armies fight over things that are petty and stupid and send a lot of innocent people to die for their country? We should fix that by arresting both armies. It's great. Uh, Jingo is one where I, I think I sort of, like, it's good, but I don't remember it as much as I remember Thud. And Thud's just so good. Um, so basically- you know, Tolkien is sending up classic fantasy tropes. Oh, excuse me. Please hold while I smite this bot with great vengeance and furious terror. Get out of here, man. All right. Uh, we're good. Sorry about that, everybody. <clears throat> anyway. Uh... Oh, right. I forgot to change it, so this is a subscriber-only chat. But you know what? I think it's okay. Um... So, 
<laughs> take three on this sentence. Terry Pratchett likes sending up fantasy tropes. And one of them is, we've got these two fantasy tropes, these two fantasy races, and they hate each other. You know, we got the dwarves and the elves in Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. Now, the reason why it's not dwarves and elves in Terry Pratchett is because Terry Pratchett has other ideas about elves. For Pratchett, elves are fae, like classic fairies, which means they are not people, and they are not at all something that, like, should exist in reality. They're from the fairy realm, and they work on their own rules, and it's very bad when they get into the real world. That's explored in the witches' novels, and they're very scary. It's great. Um, so instead, the rivalry is between dwarves and trolls. You know, dwarves are small and they mine rocks and trolls are very large and made of rock. It, you know, it kind of makes sense that they would maybe have this, like, generational rivalry. Uh, but essentially, <laughs> there's this undercurrent in the guards' novels that people come to Ankh-Morpork in the same way that people in, like, the real world come to New York City to sort of find a new life and figure out who they can be in this place that isn't where they grew up and isn't where they expected to grow up. You know, stuff like that. Uh, so you get these dwarves that come down from the mountain and they come to Ankh-Morpork and suddenly there's no rules about who they have to be. And the same thing happens with trolls. And as the guards have been expanding over the years, you know, they've gotten more people who work for them. There's a dwarf and a troll who've been working in the, there's a troll who's been working in the guards for ages and there have been various dwarfs kind of joining up. Um, and the premise of Thud is that they're coming up on the anniversary of this legendary battle between the armies of dwarves and trolls, but it's not clear in the history books which side won. And it just sort of raises these tensions, you know? It's like it, it draws these lines in the sand, and it's like, you know, it, it. a lot of the book is exploring the whole fallacy of if you're not on my side, you're on their side, when in reality, why does there have to be sides at all? Um, and it's very cool. There's also uh, an absolutely terrifying, like, eldritch abomination curse in this book called The Summoning Dark. And it's terrifying. And I love it. And it's like the fourth extra dimensional eldritch abomination that tries to possess Vimes and utterly fails. <laughs> this is my favorite kind of character archetype. Man who is literally too angry to get possessed. Oh, boy. Um... Anyway, yes, uh, so, start with Guards Guards, work your way up to Thud, then you can read everything else. Have fun. <laughs> oh, boy. <sighs> um, Vimes does not make friends with the Summoning Dark, exactly. Vimes gets a little mutual respect with the Summoning Dark. Vimes ends the book not really believing the Summoning Dark was ever a thing that actually existed and possessed him, because he doesn't believe in any of that malarkey, but, like, it's very clear. It's super clear that it happened. Um, oh, boy. Okay. Uh, oh, I forgot about Snuff, too. There, there were other Guards novels after Thud, but I'll be honest, for me, it peaked with Thud. Um... Let's see. Hmm. The Tiffany Aching series, uh, I was so into when I was like 12 and a little younger because I was Tiffany's age and I related to her so hard. Um, and I had this thing where I, I reread them more recently and the parts that I remember really hitting me did not quite hit me in the same way. I, I, I'm not really sure how to explain it. Like, they're they're quite good, uh, and they're very interesting. But there was just this, like, there were a few moments that I remember being just world-shatteringly powerful when I was little. And then I read through them again, and I was like, yeah, it's all right. So, you know, sometimes the nostalgia holds up on the second reread, and sometimes you're not quite in the right place for it to hit you like it did before. But the Tiffany Aching books are very fun. Uh, they're sort of like an offshoot, kind of, of the witches novels. They sort of... It's like they don't start off the same, but then they sort of intersect later on. Um, but yeah, they are fun and good. <sighs> Thoughts on the World War Z book? Okay. I've read the book like three times because here's the thing. I think you all know, I've talked about this before. I hate zombies so much. They scare the crap out of me. They are like the one apocalypse where I'm just like, well, there's no coming back from that everything's boned L wrap it up folks so i just don't like zombies i hate them a lot 
And the thing about World War Z, the book, is that the first third is horrible if you hate zombies. It's terrible. It's terrifying. It's terrifyingly grounded because it's written by somebody who hates zombies. They scare the crap out of him. He wrote it specifically to work through that as like, okay, what if we have like classic Romero zombies? What if we have like the, no cheats, no workarounds? These are the worst of the worst. How would we actually handle that? And he world built a very interesting answer. And honestly, all things considered, in terms of methods of therapy, pretty innovative, <laughs> I approve. But the first third is the everything is going to shit part of the book. And it is really tough to get through. Like, I, I like, made the mistake of, like, reading it, like, at night at times when I was a lot more prone to nightmares. And I would just be, like, buzzing with energy into the wee hours because I was like, I don't even want to walk down the dark hallway to get to the bathroom right now. You know, that level of fear. Uh, but this was at the age where, like, certain episodes of Doctor Who were also putting me in that headspace, so I probably should have known better. But what that meant is that, like, I kept getting freaked out and tapping out a third of the way through, when in actuality, when you read the rest of the book, it gets better from there. <laughs> like, after that is about when people start figuring out ways to approach the problem that work and, like, rebuilding in ways that actually function. Um, and once I pushed through that, I was like, oh, this is this is nice, actually, but it's... It's a tall order to get through. Um, but I got to the level of, like, I'm okay with this, where <laughs> I broke a rule I have unofficially. I I am not a fan fiction person uh, so much. I, I maybe just missed the window of when I could have gotten really into it as a concept. But in general, I tend to like taking a story at face value as a primary source and then, oh, excuse me, perish uh and then sort of not really you know thinking about it outside of that okay so anyway uh i broke that rule i i think on like the tv tropes page for um world war z there's actually this is the case on a lot of large uh tv tropes pages they have a tab that just recommends certain fanfics about it um of like oh this, you know, here, here's a fic I liked, and I, I almost never use it. But in this specific case, I read through World War Z, and I was really curious what happened with North Korea. <laughs> because in the universe of World War Z, it just goes completely dark and silent, and all the people in it seem to disappear one day. And I gotta know what happens there. That's my shit, man. That's the kind of horror I absolutely adore. I'd eat it up with a spoon. Um, and basically, there was just this fic that was like, written in the exact style of the books of, uh, it's an interview with somebody who was there like 10 or 20 years down the line, uh, basically describing an expedition into North Korea to try and figure out what happened. <laughs> and, uh, it answers just enough questions to not answer anywhere near all the questions, but it's so scary. Um, and basically it just involves like, they find these routes into these sealed underground bunkers where it seems like all the people basically went and sealed the doors behind them. And like four out of five of them, nothing seems to be amiss. Like, you know, they don't open the doors, obviously. But the fifth one, there's like moisture, there's water behind the sealed door, <laughs> which means somewhere down there in the darkness, a pump failed. Uh, and that's bad enough. But then they like sample some of the goop like some of the water and they're like oh yeah we found traces of the uh the viral the, the zombie pathogen on the other side of this so whatever was down there is n probably zombies now <laughs> and i was just like ha ha fantastic so you know it's i i have a complicated relationship with horror it's the same relationship i have with spicy food of like i don't like it but i do like it but i don't like it so um yeah, I've read that fic, I think, twice total. And every time I'm like, ha ha, I'm good for the next several months. Um, anyway, absolutely terrifying. I don't have the link on hand. Uh, but it is probably still listed on the TV Tropes fic rec for, um, uh, for World War Z. So definitely do recommend that. Uh, if you like being absolutely terrified of zombies. <laughs> Huzzah! Okay, um... Uh, so sorry, uh, the water is not a zombie. It indicates that whatever was alive down there has since been zombified, and it's possible that like 
maybe somebody who was already infected got in with the rest of them and then turned and, you know, how many people are down there? And there's sort of like this existential question of like, if somewhere down there a barrier fails, how many people are going to, how many zombies are going to spill out? How many people in this country are down there still in an animated capacity that could royally screw us over. Anyway, absolutely horrifying. I'm freaking myself out just talking about it. Um, oh boy. Uh, let's see. What's going on? Um, I keep, people keep bringing up Reign of Fire. Don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Uh, oh no, oh no. I stopped for too long and now it's, it's flying along again. Uh, I haven't played Horizon Forbidden West. I gotta say, I'm really intrigued by the lore of Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, but what I heard about what they've done in Horizon Forbidden West made me less interested. Uh, mostly because I watched the zero punctuation about it and then, um, excuse me, an extra punctuation he did about it. And I was like, oh yeah, that doesn't sound like a writing decision I agree with and that's a shame. Um, but... I think the mystery behind Horizon Zero Dawn, the first one, is just fascinating because it's like, you know, obviously you get the trailer and you're like, what's up with all these like cavemen fighting robot dinosaurs? What kind of a setting is that? Uh, I don't know why that went kind of a little bit shaggy on that. Uh, and of course, as the game progresses, it's like, well, hold on. Not only are we cave people fighting robot dinosaurs, like there's ruins of, like, old Earth cities around here. So this is the future, I guess. That explains the robot dinosaurs. But, like, what's going on? Um, and uh, the thing I like the most about the lore of the game is there's that window of time where you know enough to understand that, like, something terrible happened in the past, but we're all still here, so they must have found a way to stop it, right? And the reveal is... They absolutely didn't. <laughs> they found contingencies to reseed the Earth with life and a biosphere after everything on the planet was consumed and destroyed, and then, like, reseed it with cloned humans after the fact. But that window where they're like, okay, well, we know how the story ends. We're all here. Humans are alive. There's, like, trees and shit. So, clearly, things must have, like, worked out. And as we're getting through the audio logs, it's like, oh no, wait, but how are they going to salvage this? And the answer is, <laughs> they didn't. Um, which is just terrifying and really sad. Uh, again, it's kind of in the same vein in my head as the zombie apocalypse where it's like, oh cool, an apocalypse with a 0% long-term survival rate for humanity. Don't like that, thank you. So, uh, but I, I mean, you know, I'm a huge fan of the apocalypse log genre of tragedy, uh, which is, you know, when you like find a diary or a series of random documents and audio logs that uh, retell the final days of something. And I know exactly why I like this so much. <laughs> and it's my dad, because when I was little, my dad read me The Hobbit and then he read me The Lord of the Rings. And I, my attention span has never been fantastic. I've never been able to myself read through The Lord of the Rings in any, you know, reasonable time. I usually just lose steam and stop. So the parts of Lord of the Rings that I really stuck with were the parts that scared the crap out of me. So I remember two key moments of me like lying in bed, suddenly kind of afraid to close my eyes. And one of them was just that little anecdote that like, I want to say it's when they're in the caves and like Sam and Frodo notice that like after they stop walking, sometimes they'll hear the quote unquote echo continue for a while before stopping and that's because that's Gollum following them. And I was just like, oh, no. Uh, and of course, the other one is the Mines of Moria. Drums in the deep. We cannot get out. That's terrifying. I loved it. It was great. So anytime a story does that now, I'm like, yes, give it to me. Give me all of it. So um, very fun. And that's why I love Apocalypse Log stories and why I'm always kind of bummed out when they don't quite hit that same level of just like, oh, no. Um, oh, boy, they're so good. Um. What? Oh, what version of Journey to the West did you read? I read the translation by Anthony C. U. It's in four volumes, and it's quite good. So, definitely recommend that. Um, let's see. SCP. Oh, man. I, for a while, I want to say, like, in late high school and early college, 
I'd like every six months or so go through a like a like a phase where I'd suddenly be seized with the urge to go on like r slash no sleep and like the SCP wiki and just read a bunch of little scary drabbles of like scary stuff that was scary. Um, and I fortunately seem to have outgrown that because as mentioned, I'm bad with like inflicting scary things on myself that make my already tumultuous sleep schedule significantly worse. Uh, but I just, I just, you know, it was fun. It was like little bite-sized nuggets of horror. Um, and it's been a while since I went on the SCP wiki, but there was stuff on there that I really liked. And one of them was basically an apocalypse log shocker. Uh, I don't, obviously I don't remember the number. Um, like a lot of the SCP thing is just kind of like, what if we took a cryptid and we like described it, said we had it in a box somewhere, that's fine. Um, but there was one that was like this, this disc. And if you put it on a mirror, the mirror became a portal to what appeared to be an alternate timeline of Earth. And they kept sending through these, like, D-class personnel uh, to explore it. And, of course, it was all written as, like, audio log records and, like, this very sort of uh, clinical attitude towards what was going on, you know, sort of, like, clinically describing that as the camera pans past, there are seven shadowy figures visible in the elevator that the personnel recording doesn't seem able to see or react to just like that kind of shit is my absolute jam i think the last few times i yeah the red sea object that sounds about right um and i think the last couple times like i went on the scp wiki i saw a lot more things that basically just looked like short stories written in the style of short stories and it's like that's fine but for me that doesn't really hit that real horror like that perfect zone you know um I don't think I ever really, like, figured out what the deal with the Red Sea object was supposed to be, because it was like, okay, there's, like, there's goop everywhere. All right, there's goop, and there's, like, ghosts and shit, and then there's, like, weird giants, like, sludge monsters, I guess? I don't know. Um, but, like, the the environmental storytelling of, like, we found this completely empty farmhouse, and, like, uh, like empty sets of clothes that appeared to have dropped as if the person in them just suddenly got absorbed into a giant goop monster, for instance. And I was like, oh, okay, I wonder what happened here. <laughs> no points for guessing that giant goop monsters are involved. Anyway, so, um, definitely very cool. Uh, I, I know it's sort of changed since then. I, I mean, I haven't really been in it in a while, so it hasn't really bothered me. But, you know, I, I remember fondly the days of extremely clinically described, abjectly horrifying objects. Uh, so... <sighs> Let's see. Um, doo -doo. Sorry, just taking my sweet time looking at chat, pouring myself a second tiny cup full of slightly gross cloudy yellow tea. Uh, oh yes, and for those in chat who aren't aware, SCP is, uh, short for Secure, Contain, Protect, and it's, uh, the conceit is that it is a, like, an online repository of documentation about a secret organization that secures, contains, and protects the world from dangerous objects or entities. It's, you know, it, it basically is a, an open source creative writing project that people have a lot of fun with. It's kind of the vibe, um. <laughs> can you stop talking about scary stuff please it is scary i would love to i'm freaking myself out so let's talk about something else i did like the infinite ikea um oh no oh what sorry i left the tea alone and it steeped more and now it's like spicy i guess that's the ginger um ugh. but yes it's very similar to creepypasta but it's got more like rigid tone constraints which is pretty cool uh and I've also, you know, there are stuff kind of like that now that, like, VFX artists do. So, like, the stuff about the back rooms kind of feels like the same SCP sort of ARG, evil, weird, spooky dimension horror stuff. Um, uh, of course, they're making a video game based on Infinite Ikea. I think I actually had a nightmare about the Infinite Ikea once. Uh, but the trick is, I just climb to the top of the shelves, which is something I've always wanted to do in, like, real, like, Costco's and Ikea's and stuff like that, because, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, oh my god, yes, Turning Red, thank you for giving me something to talk about that isn't Nightmare Fuel. I really liked Turning Red, um, and I think I liked Turning Red more 
because I watched it a couple months after I watched Encanto. And Turning Red really worked for me in all the ways that I found I sort of couldn't quite make Encanto click in my head. Like, I don't want to turn this into negativity. I thought Encanto was great. I loved the musical numbers. There were... I've said this before. I think that the thing I had that made Encanto not quite work for me is that Encanto is a scattershot of emotional issues. It has so many characters, each one with their own unique cocktail of, like, familial generational trauma, that the odds are very good that if you watch Encanto, there's going to be at least one character where you're like, oh, that hits a little close to home. <laughs> um, uh, let's just say that uh, when I sing along to surface pressure, parts of it come from the heart a little more than others. <laughs> um, and what this means is that, like, if you watch Encanto and you're completely removed from it and you're just taking it as, like, okay, right, uh, these are the characters, they exist in this movie, this is how they interact with each other, then you probably, it probably totally works. It's like, oh, what a satisfying journey. But if you watch the movie and you over-relate to almost any character that isn't Isabella, uh, you're probably not going to come away fully satisfied. Because <laughs> the way that character arc resolves for, like, Mirabelle and, and Bruno especially, and, like, if you go into that and you're like, boy, I feel like these characters should maybe just leave and go literally anywhere else where, like, people who appreciate them might be. I don't know. And then at the end of the movie, they're like, everything's fine. And we actually loved you the whole time, even when we weren't acting like it and you felt alone and completely isolated, often purposefully so. It's like, this doesn't really feel like a satisfying conclusion. This kind of feels like you're trying to convince them that nothing was ever wrong except their attitude. And I personally don't like that so much. So... Again, like, the movie is basically working as intended. It just did parts of its job too well. <laughs> like, it made the characters almost too relatable in such intensely personal ways that I think, like, and, you know, I, I've also heard a lot of people had complaints about the magic coming back at the end. Personally, I didn't mind that so much. I hate stories where the magic goes away at the end. I think it's a huge bummer. I think the world would be more interesting with magic in it. And it's sad to me when they give me a world with magic in it, and then they're like, isn't it better when none of that is true? So I didn't mind that the magic came back, but I know a few people who were like, it kind of felt like the whole point of the movie got undercut because they all learned that they were more than their powers and then they got their powers back. So, you know, um, anyway, that part didn't bother me. But again, like it, it's sort of indicative of my thesis that like the movie hits everybody almost so personally that it ends up kind of, excuse me, it ends up kind of not hitting the way it's intended to. But I did not have that problem with turning red. I think that Turning Red covered its bases very clearly by making it so that each character's individual issues were so clearly personal to them that, like, you could relate to them without necessarily over-projecting onto any of the characters. Like, the main characters, you know, every character in that movie has such a strong personality that, like, even if you were like, I can relate to this specific thing, you're not going to be like, well, I would never react like this, so I, I'm immediately flung out of the immersion of this movie, <laughs> you know? Um... Although I will say that uh, I, it took me like 20 minutes to get past that one scene early in the movie where the mother like takes her like horny drawings <laughs> where she's like exploring the concept of cute boys and like confronts the boy she was drawing with them. Like I had to like stop every 15 seconds and like take a fucking walk because that's the nightmare scenario <laughs> for anyone who's ever drawn anything moderately embarrassing in a sketchbook so um <laughs> i like when i was talking to my parents about it i was like i think that mom would like it but i think she might need a content warning for this one bit <laughs> so um anyway uh yeah so aside from that one scene that's like absolute agony the rest of the movie is very fun and i liked it and I liked that uh, she kept her, like, red panda powers at the end of the movie. I would have been kind of bummed if, once again, the magic goes away. Would have been sad. Um, anyway, I liked it. But yes, I, I did cringe so hard that my face imploded. So, you know, very unfortunate. Oh, boy. Uh, but yes, the, uh, the, the stuff about, like, the overprotective mother and the, the, the absolutely no boundaries, I was like, this is, like, too real but in such a cartoonishly exaggerated way that it doesn't feel uncomfortably real. It just feels uncomfortable, you know? Um, 
Anyway, uh, let's see. Lightyear. I, okay, I was gonna watch Lightyear. I was very excited for Lightyear. And then I heard that it was only okay, and I heard, like, the stuff they did with it, and I was like, that sounds like it's gonna make me sad. And I haven't watched it yet. I do want to. I think it would be interesting. Um, but I think mostly what I saw is that, uh, it didn't really, okay, don't, sorry, person in chat telling everyone in chat to type something that isn't even, like, a media recommendation, it's just a meme or something, like, it's bad enough that people spam organically, <laughs> but come on, guys, it's only funny when I tell people to all type something in chat, and it's only funny when there are other people on the stream to suffer with me. Anyway, I haven't watched Lightyear yet, I do intend to, but I no longer have high expectations going into it. But it is kind of cool that Chris Evans is getting to voice act more because he's just, like, a good voice actor. Like, he's good at it. <laughs> and it's so funny because I watched through a bunch of uh, What If, remember when that was going out? Um, and, you know, the very first episode is the whole, like, what if we got, you know, Captain Britain instead of Captain America. And it's just immediately obvious that Chris Evans is acting everybody else under the table because he has actual voiceover experience. He's not just a, a screen actor who's, like, suddenly put in a recording booth and told, like, hey, you know that thing that you normally do with your entire body? Uh, do that with just your voice for, like, the next 30 minutes. Have fun. Uh, but he already has experience with that, and he's just, like, outclassing everybody. And then in every later episode, it just becomes increasingly obvious <laughs> how much better he is at it than almost everybody else in the entire MCU. So... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad they're letting him do it more because he's good at it, like genuinely good at it. Not even just good at it by like typically screen actor standards. So, what? The guy who's, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. The guy who voiced Steve was not Chris Evans? Well, he is still really good, uh, but that's a bummer. <laughs> uh, I really thought I'd clocked him on that. Hold on. Uh, please hold while I... Uh, uh, attempt to google this uh <laughs> what if episode one imdb come on um wow well now i just questioning everything i know about reality uh oh geez why did they keep they keep restructuring imdb and i don't like it uh oh wait did they just get josh keaton well, that's good casting. He's just a good Captain America. Anyway, my point still stands. Chris Evans is just a categorically better voice actor than almost everyone else in the MCU. Um, I should have known it was Josh Keaton. He's just good at voiceover. <laughs> um, but Chris Evans does play Buzz in Lightyear, and when the trailer for that came out, I was like, he's just really good. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess chaos does reign, but this time it's my fault, so whatever. <sighs> well, Josh Keaton's good in everything, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> This is exactly when I uh, mistook, when I conflated uh, Kimiko Glenn and another completely different woman. <laughs> so that's my fault. Uh, anyway. Ooh, I get to recommend Hilda to more people. Thank you, the one person in chat who brought that up. Um, Hilda is really, really cute. It's also on Netflix, so very accessible. Uh, it's heavily based on like Icelandic and Scandinavian folklore kind of um well parts of it are very overtly based on especially Icelandic folklore there's like a whole episode where the premise is wrestling ghosts and it's just straight out of the saga of Gretir so very good uh it is like the coziest show I've seen in a very long time the aesthetic I ended up sort of describing it with is that it feels like like Studio Ghibli meets like Calvin and Hobbes kind of in that it's got this incredibly cozy soft whimsical mysterious dangerous but in a very wild and natural way vibe and then the main character is an adorably precocious cartoony small child with an animal sidekick um and it all kind of comes together to feel just incredibly cozy and homey and all the environments just really feel very like comfortable and 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 homey i don't know it's really cool the color palette's very interesting it's almost like it's like it's designed so that if you're a certain kind of colorblind, it won't register differently at all. Like, all the greens are very muted, uh, but in a way that really works. It's extremely cute, uh, but it also has some very interesting overall themes of, like, man versus nature and stuff like that. 
Um, yeah, uh, I definitely recommend it. It got, I want to say, two seasons in a movie, uh, and it's good. It's good, and I recommend it. Um, let's see. Haven't played Disco Elysium. Haven't watched Primal, but I know about it. Uh, of course, have I watched Teen Titans? Of course I've watched Teen Titans. <laughs> what kind of mid-2000s edgelord would I have been if I didn't super over-relate to Robin and Raven? Come on. Uh, like most people, I have obviously not watched Teen Titans Go because I like Teen Titans and thus cannot uh, appreciate what it's become. But that's okay. The original series is still there, so everything's fine. Um, I... <laughs> Here's the funny thing. I have read through a lot of the comics, the, I want to say, like, Silver Age? I'm not as exactly sure. Uh, but, like, the run of Teen Titans that loosely got adapted into, like, basically all the adaptations. So, you know, uh, when you got uh, Judas Contract, when you got, uh, I guess, even the Brother Blood stuff, technically speaking, uh, Trigon, Terror of Trigon, um, all that stuff happened in a very specific era in the comics, uh, which is where, <laughs> among other things, uh, Dick Grayson changed from being Robin to being Nightwing. Uh, like, that happened in one of the arcs, and he had this great outfit as his first Nightwing appearance. Uh, it's affectionately referred to by the fans, I understand, as a disco wing, because it really looks like he's getting ready to hit the dance floor. It's just truly spectacular. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's a very different tone than the cartoon, obviously, but it's not, like, how to describe it's sort of simultaneously darker and less dark <laughs> um they're dark in different ways so like the cartoon was sort of like what if we took robin who is allegedly dick grayson and made him basically mini batman so he's kind of got the personality that like damien got later on uh of like I'm, like, very serious and badass and, and, like, super stubborn and stuff, but also I'm, like, a kid, you know? Um, which is not the personality that Dick Grayson ever has in the comics. I mean, he sometimes does, but it's never, like, good. <laughs> so, uh, he tends to be more of kind of, like, an even-keeled paragon leader in the comics, and everyone else is where they hide the angst, mostly, like, Raven and, like, Kid Flash have, like, an on-again, off-again relationship that never works out kind of situation. It's it's a whole thing. Um, but, so, basically, the cartoon version is unrecognizable from the comic version, but I like them both because my brain doesn't register that they're trying to be the same thing. Uh, and uh, I, I say this is funny because uh, this is the problem my dad had with the cartoon because he grew up reading a lot of those, like classic Teen Titans comics and he really liked them and then they're like we're doing a cartoon version and he's like great and then he watches it and he's like oh no <laughs> so for me I was like I like both of these things but I wasn't expecting this to be this thing that I liked uh so it worked out for me fine um and I was kind of pleasantly surprised by how they handled some of the really big intense arcs from the comics uh <laughs> you know like Whoever made the cartoon definitely liked the comics a lot because they did a lot of, like, like niche stuff. And it's clear that every time they got another season, they were like, oh, we get to do another one of the iconic arcs. So it's like, okay, first, we're going to just kind of have Slade be, like, evil. We're getting, like, one season. It's whatever. And then after that, it's like, oh, shoot, okay, uh, let's do the Judas contract. Woo! Let's make Tara more sympathetic than she is in the comics because that's, boy, that's not hard. The bar is really low. Um... And then, like, oh, we're gonna, we, we got a third season. Let's, I think that one was Bl Brother Blood, right? Which is a weird one to adapt. He he doesn't kid-friendlyify easily. And then it's like, oh, we got the fourth season. Perfect. We can do Terror of Trigon and call it a day. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, we got a fifth season? <laughs> I guess we can do Titans East or something? Which is fine, you know. It, that, that show, I didn't mind that it got a final season because that, like, wasn't really as good as the rest because it's like it wasn't terrible didn't break anything i liked you know whatever um anyway uh yeah so <laughs> i i gotta try rewatching that show honestly because i do remember really liking it the first like couple times i got through it and of course it is a great example i use it all the time in various trope talks i uh <laughs> i had a moment I, i'm filling out the details for a, an upcoming trope talk no spoilers but uh i was like oh i need a i need a good example of like 
how it's so much more impactful when like a character sort of knows they're doomed and like sees it coming but can't really do anything to stop it because of like a prophecy and i just for like three days i was like i just don't know what to do and i was like raven in the terror of trigon what am i fucking doing <laughs> just edited that in and everything was fine anyway uh oh let's see uh Sorry, comment from uh, <clears throat> our bud Ludo History, by the way. Welcome to the chat. Sorry, I didn't say hi earlier. Uh, See, so you just hit on my problem with most film adaptations of comics. Why do so many just try and tell the comics, but in movie form? TV is better at this because serialization. That is absolutely true. I've talked about this before. Again, I feel bad that Indigo's not on this call, uh, because it is not a call. Um, But basically, <sighs> serialized media can translate into other serialized media without too much difficulty. So, like, a manga can be translated into an anime without too much complexities. Uh, a comic can be translated into a show. But if you try and translate a comic into a movie, they are very different shapes. Uh, you need to do a lot of work to make one fit into the other. Um, and sometimes there is, like, a, a nugget at the heart of the comic arc that you can make into the plot of a movie. But sometimes there isn't. And the main difficulty is that movies are sort of designed to stand alone. Like, by their nature. You walk in, you know, the lights dim, you have your snacks, you're in your own little world with the movie until it's over. And, you know, sometimes you'll, like, you'll, like, walk out of the theater and feel like a completely different person. Because it's got a beginning and an end, and in the middle is where all the good stuff happens. Serialized media does not do that so much serialized media is good for other things it's good for constructing what feels like a large lived-in world with a large cast where characters can just drop in and out as needed or like cameo or crossover or you know vanish for a while and then come back in a different way you don't have that kind of time frame when you're dealing with a movie and you don't have that kind of open ending um so the fact that we have movies that are essentially trying to serialize is kind of showing the cracks in this fundamental translation where you can make movies that are sequels to each other, but they kind of still need to have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, you know, even, you know, if we look at, like, the, the original Star Wars trilogy, like, the first one works as a standalone. Like, sure, they didn't defeat the entire Empire, but, like, they could have. They blew up the big thing. Maybe the Emperor was on it. We don't know. It would have been fine. Um, and the second movie has a beginning, middle, and end. And the end is still kind of open-ended. It's a little bittersweet. It's a little bit weird. Oh, we kind of just got our asses kicked and our friend's been captured. What are we going to do? But it is an ending. And, you know, it left people wanting more, but not in a, like, nothing was answered. What's going on? And it also gave them time to process that whole I'm your father thing. So, you know, good stuff. And, of course, the third one, beginning, middle, end. It's great. And, uh, I won't say that really applied to the, for instance, Star Wars sequel movies, if we're just pulling examples out of nowhere, I don't know. <laughs> um, I do want to say, I feel like Episode Seven kind of had a beginning, middle, end, but also it really knew it was getting a sequel. It was getting two sequels, so, uh, didn't end so good. Uh, anyway, all that to say, um... It's a lot easier to translate something that is serialized media into a different form of serialized media, but... I mean, it's, it's also possible to translate something that is sort of a, a single unit, a block of story, into a serialized format. There are some books that work better when adapted into shows. Um, I enjoyed Shadow and Bone. I haven't read the book it's based on, so I can't speak to its accuracy. But it kind of took advantage of the fact that that book seems to have a very large ensemble cast and a lot of shifting perspectives. And uh, sort of translated it into an episodic format where we have a lot of little mini-stories that all lead into each other. Uh, and, you know, you, like, you can translate a book into a movie, not necessarily well, but, like, it's an easier hoist than translating an entire, like, like multi-year comic run into a movie, for instance. Uh, oh, uh, and um, the person in chat bringing up the Batman Beyond movie, that really only works if you are familiar with Batman Beyond. Uh because it's a tie-in movie, and uh, tie-in movies to series are often in this odd, unique space where, like, sometimes they're basically just feature-length episodes of the show, you know? Uh, and I think those tend to be the best uh, that tie-in movies can be, because they don't feel like they're story-breaking. Um, 
This leads to, I think, actually, possibly one of my hottest take opinions, which is that I think sometimes non-canon filler anime movies are more fun than the actual show. <laughs> I mean, here's what you all need to understand, okay? The first anime that I ever seriously watched was Inuyasha. It was the, it was the first one I saw, and it very much warped my perspective on what was normal for anime. Uh, for one thing, it kind of made me assume that protagonists were a lot sturdier than they actually are. Like, the second clip of anime I ever saw was a clip from the, like, 2003 Full Metal Alchemist, where Ed gets, like, fully stabbed through the chest by, like, I don't know, a bad guy or whatever, and everyone's like, no, brother! And I was just like, that happens to Inuyasha every three episodes. Why is everyone freaking out? And then I was like, oh, right. He's, like, super tough. He's like Wolverine. Okay, my bad. Sorry. Uh, take it from the top, everybody. Oh, no, he's stabbed. Um, but the thing about that is that there are four tie-in Inuyasha movies, and I like every single one of them. <laughs> I'm not going to claim they're good, but they do feel like feature-length episodes of the show. And the cool thing about them being filler is that they can't really do much to upset the status quo, which means, like, everything sort of resets nicely at the end, you know? All the good guys are okay, nothing too bad happens, if any secondary characters get introduced, they're not going to be that important, but, you know, they're probably still going to be around. Um, I don't even remember them that much, I just remember really liking them, especially the third one. Uh, I think the other thing is that every movie basically just, like, <laughs> palette swaps a bad guy from the show and is like, it's my new original character, do not steal. So in the first one, it's like the bad guys are a bunch of moth demons and there's like a moth demon in the show. He's like a filler bad guy. And now it's like, there's more of them. And also we we cloned Kikyo again. She's evil now, which is something that <laughs> I think they do that in like every movie. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's weird. Uh, What the fuck's the second one? I think that's the one where Princess Kaguya is the main villain, which was kind of wild, actually. Because <laughs> uh, it's just like accurate, sort of, to the myth. I mean, she's evil. But then it's revealed that she's, like, actually a demon that ate Princess Kaguya and assumed her form, which is, like, heck yeah. Get it, girl. Um, but, yeah, there's just, uh, from what I recall in the actual myth, there's, like, the bit where she's, like, retrieve me, like, the robe of the fire rat, which is just, like, canonically what Inuyasha wears. So, like, literally the inciting incident of the movie is that, like, a couple bad guys, like, mug him and steal his sleeve. And he's like, what the fuck is happening? And I didn't understand the mythology, like, context at the time. I was just like, wow, that's wild. And then I read through it and I was like, huh, it's just literally the thing. Okay, cool. Um, and the third one's great. It's got an evil sword, really fucked up. It's like classic superpowered evil side stuff. But with all that good, I know you're in there somewhere. Fight contact I love. Um, anyway, I'm not trying to sell you guys on these movies. I don't think they're probably actually good, but I had a great time watching them. At the same time, I had a great time watching the show. And this did not happen with almost every other tie-in anime filler movie I've ever watched. In fact, they are notoriously terrible uh, and generally quite bad, even if the original show is good. So, like, there's a Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood tie-in movie, Conqueror Shambhala or whatever. I think that's right. Or was that the was that the original tie? Whatever. There's a Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood tie-in movie that's really bad, and it's like surprising how bad it is, considering how good Brotherhood is. Uh, and that was kind of when I was like, oh, it really doesn't matter if the original's good. A lot of these movies are hot garbage. That's weird. Um, but then, like, there's a, there's a Cowboy Bebop tie-in movie, which I think might have actually been, like, what I saw before I saw the show. And I'll be honest, I was one of those people who didn't really get Cowboy Bebop. Like, I, I watched the whole thing. I think I technically watched the whole thing twice. And at no point did I ever understand what I was supposed to like about it. Uh, the voice acting was surprisingly good for such an early dub. Uh, and some of the fight choreography was good, and that's all I got, man. That's all I got out of it. Uh, but the movie had to have, like, a three-act structure and, like, a beginning, middle, end and a solid bad guy. So I liked it more. <laughs> anyway, was it Sacred Star of Milos? I think Conqueror Shambhala is the 2003 one, which also wasn't great. But, uh, yeah, the Sacred Star of Milos one, I think, is the one. And it's, like, the Brotherhood tie-in movie, like, breaks the laws of alchemy <laughs> in the universe. Like, they're normally so good about that, but then they're like, oh, this character's gonna actually successfully pull off human transmutation. <laughs> and it's like, hold the fucking up a second, please. <laughs> Did we just contradict the entire premise of the entire show? 
for this new character in the movie? What? I think there were also werewolves. I don't even remember at this point. It wasn't good, though. <laughs> um, and they introduced, like, a 3D alchemy circle, which is a kind of a cool concept. But they, like, power it by this one dead lady's blood. And, like, the circle is, like, the size of a city. And it's just one dead lady. And I was like, I don't think she has that much blood in her, man. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. It was just wild. Uh, but all that means is that anime tie-in filler movies don't have to be good. And that's not a take. But the fact that they can be good, that's a take. And I think the spiciest take I can provide is not the Inuyasha example. Because as mentioned, I like the actual show. So it's not weird to me that I would enjoy a full-length version of an episode of the show. I like the Bleach tie-in movie. And I don't like Bleach. <laughs> I liked the show that Bleach said it was going to be in the first season, and then it wasn't that show. I tried. I really did. But I caught myself doing mental math to figure out how many more episodes I would have to slog through before they actually beat the bad guy and got back to the plot, and that was when I stopped watching the show. But there's a movie, and the good thing about the tie-in filler anime movie is because it's only a movie, it has to have pacing. <laughs> So they can't drag it out. They can't just stuff it full of secondary bad guys and boss fights with all the random, like, various captains of the different whatevers. And, like, I thought it was cool. It was like a speed run of the first season again because the premise of the movie, I think it's called Memories of Nobody. Um, the premise of the movie is that, like, this bad guy, like, kidnaps Rukia and erases everyone's memories of her except for Ichigo. Uh, so nobody else in the Soul Society remembers that Rukia exists and nobody in the Soul Society remembers that Ichigo exists because they, like, they only met him through her. Uh, so he basically speedruns the Soul Society rescue arc to go and save Rukia when like, he has to fight his way through all these guys who he's been on the same side as for like years at this point. But he's also like, I don't have time for this, man. I got to go save Rukia. And they're like, who's Rukia? Why would you say that name? And he's like, okay, we got to buy. <laughs> and just fucks off. And it's great. It's like... It's like the original, it's like the first season, but the pacing's good, actually. And I just, I adore that. So I remember genuinely liking that movie. I don't know if it's actually good, but I liked it more than the first season of Bleach. So, or I guess the second season. Is that the second season? Anyway. Um, yes, yeah, so basically the pacing of a movie is quite unique compared to the pacing of a serialized show. And that doesn't mean it, it's bad, but it does mean it needs to be accounted for. Uh, God, I have not been looking at chat at all. I've just been in the anime rant zone. <laughs> I snapped back to age 15 for a minute. Um, oh boy. Uh, am I thinking of Fade to Black or wait, are you talking to somebody in chat? I guess that makes sense. Um, uh, I haven't seen Sea Beast yet. I've actually I've seen a lot of cute stuff about it though, so I'm I am probably gonna watch it. Um, oh boy. <laughs> oh no, everyone wants more anime rant. Oh god, it's been ages since I like properly watched just like a good anime all the way through. Um Like I've I've tried, you know. I've I've watched bits of a lot of anime. Uh <laughs> And it's weird. When I was in, like, deep in the anime zone, there are full shows that I just fully watched and remember nothing about. Uh, like, I think at one point I watched all of Code Geass and all of Soul Eater, and I could barely tell you the names of the main characters, let alone, like, the good moments <laughs> or, like, the plot. Uh, I watched... Uh, bunch of demon slayer and then i read the entire rest of demon slayer and it was cool and we're good and i was watching i was keeping up with hero academia for a while and then i read head in the manga and then i sort of stopped and now i kind of know what's going on and i'm just sort of waiting for it to wrap up so i can get through the whole thing at a time but like it's not quite the same thing it's just like really get, oh yeah yu yu haka show that that's definitely that's an anime i could rant about uh because like i do like it but it's almost in the same category as Bleach for me, where it's like, the reason I liked it was the thing it promised to be in the first season. And then it kind of stopped being that, except in the filler arcs. Um, 
it uh it had a really good like sort of ensemble cast dynamic and it had a very fun like four-man band and all that stuff and it also has a couple tie-in movies but the weird thing about the tie-in movie is that the voice cast is completely different like a different dubbing company got the rights for it so it's a completely different dub cast than the entire rest of the show and it's so disorienting (laughs) um oh boy uh let's see yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, also, like, the other thing is I feel like probably the pacing on Yu Yu Hakusho would be better reading the manga because some of it is like, did this have to be an entire episode? I feel like nothing happened. <laughs> or, like, something happens every, like, three episodes in the dark tournament arc. Like, early on, the pacing is incredibly brisk. It's like, okay, our main character's dead. He's got to redeem himself, so he comes back. Let's go, let's go, let's go. He's got to work through... These new guys that are going to be his best friends. Then he's got to fight his way through this castle full of bad guys. Let's go. And then after that, it's like, uh, I mean, we got like 50 guys for you to fight, but we also got like 150 episodes to fill. So like you can, I don't know, let's like hang out in the hotel for this episode or I don't know, fucking work on like an ultimate attack or something or like hang out with your mentor, I guess. That would be cool. Um, And uh, it's good. I mean, it <laughs> it's got a lot of good moments in it. But pacing wise, it's a little bit inexcusable. And I feel bad for the poor kids that like had to watch it like one episode a week (laughs) where it's like you're just hoping this is an episode where somebody throws a punch. I mean, you know, it's it's like watching the original Dragon Ball dub, the original Frieza fight where it's like, all right, the mangaka hasn't published to the next chapter yet. So it looks like we're going to be staring at each other for another five minutes. (laughs) It's just like, all right, you tell it, buddy. Um... Sorry, the fucking, I, all right, I think everyone needs to be aware of the comment from Yo-Yo Man 565 saying, yeah, Kumar's got to fight this guy with yo-yos for two episodes and not even one. First of all, I love that your username is Yo-Yo Man 565 to point out the fucking yo-yo thing. Second, I remember that fight and it still pisses me off. Oh, why do I like this show? (laughs) Anyway, um, I did, okay, I did read through all of berserk i think and it was very interesting uh i mean in the same way that uh there's a lot of horror i don't really like berserk has its ups and downs and i think it's very interesting but i don't know if i enjoyed the experience very much that doesn't mean it's bad it means it's effective at doing something i don't know if i liked experiencing um oh boy let's see uh Oh, yes, Daniel Green is doing a video series uh, reviewing Berserk. I haven't watched it because I've already read Berserk, but uh, Daniel Green is cool, so check those out. Um, (laughs) I can go back to Yu Yu Hakusho. Uh, There's a lot of other stuff. Um, Ooh, I see someone has said the magic words of Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero, summoning me from my 5,000-year slumber. Um, So the thing about Yu-Gi-Oh! is I sort of realized like five years down the line that I'm just not the target audience for Yu-Gi-Oh! because I'm one of those people who think it would have been better if it wasn't about card games. (laughs) And that means I'm just really not, you know, if I think it would be better if it didn't have the core premise of the show, that means I don't actually like it. And I've come to accept that. But this is why I think season zero and the corresponding arc of the manga is good. Now for those of you who haven't heard the the sword and tail, uh, when Yu-Gi-Oh! started out, it was sort of a game of the week horror manga. Uh, like, genuinely, it was a horror story. Uh, the main character, Yugi Moto, was very, very meek and kind of soft and, and easily bullied and very lonely, except for his best friend, Anzu, who would go to bat for him no matter what, but I guess she didn't count. It's fine. Uh, and he reassembled an ancient Egyptian puzzle and made a wish on it for friends and was possessed by a spirit of darkness that would take him over and wreak vengeance on people that it considered to be evildoers. So that's good, but it did also get him friends, so I guess it counts. And, like, that's the premise of, like, the first couple volumes is this kid blacks out, and when he wakes up, his latest school bully is, like, in the hospital or permanently insane or maybe even dead, and he's just like... Okay, um, 
So that's wild. Uh, but also, uh, the creator of the manga just really liked designing games. Like, he just designed a little, like, hey, what if we, like, played this game or that game or whatever, and then, like, would design the corresponding, like, shadow game version where they play it like a saw trap. Uh, and uh, that those chapters in the manga are one thing, and then there's chapters in, uh, there are episodes of Season Zero, which was a an anime that was not related to the Duel Monsters anime that we all saw in, like, you know, middle school or whatever. Uh, basically, it was a completely different anime with a completely different animation style done by a totally different studio, and it covered those chapters of the manga that never got turned into the Duel Monsters anime. Um, and it was pretty wild. <laughs> it, uh, it still toned things down from the manga. Like, in the manga, it would be like, oh, uh, you're going to lose this game and then you are going to plummet 50 feet into this river. And then in the anime, they'd be like, it's okay. He only hallucinated he was being eaten by trash worms. Uh, he's actually just uh, permanently insane, I guess, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, or like, <laughs> there's, I think the most overt, like we're going to tile this down so our protagonist didn't just murder someone in cold blood is there's like a... Uh, quite good episode where like a bad guy like takes everybody hostage in this burger joint including oh no Anzu she's been taken hostage she was working at that burger joint uh and uh <laughs> Yugi gets taken over by his dark side and uh like challenges the guy to a game and the game is we each pick a finger and then we try and kill the other person with that finger notably the other guy has a gun <laughs> and is like okay easy uh, but, uh, then, uh, Yugi is like, here, uh, I've given you some, like, like, really intense vodka that you're pouring, and, uh, here, uh, let me light your cigarette for you, and the finger he chooses to use is his thumb, and he, like, turns the lighter on and then drops it onto the guy's hand that, wh where he's pouring the vodka, so basically, if he, like, moves or fires the gun and, like, jolts the lighter off, he's just gonna fully set himself on fire, and then Yugi's like, all right, we're leaving, and then the guy like does anyway or fires the gun and the spark from the gun sets him off or no i think what it might be is that he's genuinely like oh it's easy i'll just put this down and then i'll like take the lighter off and yugi's like haha penalty game time and the guy just catches fire <laughs> so and then they just fucking leave and they're like wow it's crazy how that guy just burned to death and then in the anime they're like oh wow he's only imagining that he's on fire <laughs> that's much better so you know it's better. He's not dead, I guess. So, woo! <laughs> um, anyway, it's absolutely wild and really dark. And then, like, the manga dials it down significantly later on. But not as much as the anime would make you think it did. Um, like, one thing that I I don't really approve of in the Duel Monsters anime is that uh, they keep nerfing my boy Joey. My best boy, Joey Wheeler. Also known as Junochi Katsuya in the original. If you're a weeb or annoying... Um, and, uh, in the manga, it's, like, pretty consistently clear that Joey is, like, just a really good fighter, like, because he was, like, he was, like, a juvenile delinquent gangster, so of course he's a good fighter, and they keep running into all these, like, card game tough guy posers like Bandit Keith, but if it ever comes down to an actual fight, Joey just wins categorically, and that's all gone in the anime, where everyone from, like, Bandit Keith to fucking Seto Kaiba can beat Joey in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. And I'm like, that's, you're doing my boy dirty. I think it's funny that if this were an actual fight, Joey would just win. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> so I have a lot of thoughts on Yu-Gi-Oh! Most of them very affectionate. But I wish it wasn't so much about the card game. <laughs> Personally, I think Yu-Gi-Oh! could have used an exploration of the magic system or letting the cool, like, ancient Egyptian ghost who's possessing the main character do anything with his powers that isn't just card games? I don't know. Call me old-fashioned, I thought it would maybe cool if we saw real monsters sometimes. That's another show where I really like the filler arcs more than I think I like the actual arcs, where it's like... Because they always give the filler arcs stakes, you know? Where it's like, we're trapped in the virtual world, and if we are, like, injured in this card game, we feel it. And I'm like, oh no, that's not a normal side effect of a children's card game. So, by definition, I'm more invested in your success. And then they get back to reality, and it's like... Haha, <laughs> with the power of this shadow game, you'll be, uh, mildly inconvenienced whenever you lose life points. I'm so devious. And they're like, oh, you're so devious. You, you know what I mean? It's like, come on, guys. Uh, 
anyway. <sighs> I, I just think it would be cool if they let him do actual cool magic shit. I'm just saying. <laughs> and, like, they let Bakora do that shit. He's like, I have a card from this card game, and now I'm going to use my powers to make the card manifest its effect in reality. And I'm like, that would be busted as hell if they let Yugi do that. But they never do. Come on, guys. Anyway. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, thoughts on a Bridget series. Any abridged series. I have a deep and abiding affection in my heart for a Bridget series. I, like many people, got into Yu-Gi-Oh! the abridged series at a young age and Dragon Ball the abridged series at a slightly older young age. And I like them a lot. And then I witnessed the abridged series bubble uh, grow to enormous size and then collapse seemingly overnight, <laughs> leaving only... Uh, basically Yu-Gi-Oh! and Dragon Ball the Abridged Series, which was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, I think, I mean, I really like them. I, I've talked about this before. My very first idea for something I might want to put online was an Abridged Series that never saw the light of day and never will because it would have been bad and one of, like, 16 competing Inuyasha Abridged Series that nobody wanted to see. But... I I really like them. I like them enough to want to do something like them. And I think that's a very important milestone in, you know, any sort of creative endeavor is being aware of what things did you like enough to inspire you to try and imitate them. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, you know, I, Dragon Ball Abridged is no longer running. They're, they're doing other stuff. And I 100% respect that personally. I think they ended where the show should have ended anyway, possibly a season later. Um, and I'm very happy with what they produced, and it was very cool seeing them get so much better over time. You know, the, the voiceover quality improving, the edits getting better, the visual quality, the voice acting just getting much better. Okay, everyone keeps talking about, like, Sword Art Online abridged. That was, like, after my time. Like, I saw that it existed, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I don't like Sword Art Online. <laughs> I don't care about it. And that meant I didn't want to watch the abridged series. Like with Dragon Ball abridged and Yu-Gi-Oh abridged, I liked the originals. But there were things about them that I found dumb that the abridged series was sort of like self-referential about. And I thought that was fun. I just don't like Sword Art Online. <laughs> and in that specific case, man, I didn't really want to watch that. The one exception is I watched 50% 50 uh, off the free abridged series and I adored it. <laughs> it was so funny to me. <laughs> and I... I don't know. I wasn't the target audience for free, I think. <laughs> I watched it with a few people who I want to say were more into the, like, extremely hunky anime boy thing than I was. And, and I was just like, okay, they sure are swimming a lot. And I guess there's like a, I don't know, a theme of, like, growing up and no longer being a prodigy. But mostly it's all the ab shots. So I don't know. Anyway, so, yes, I really like a bridge series and I'm, I'm glad they existed. And it's very cool to see the people who made them do stuff. Whether or not it's related to those bridge series. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> okay. So, apparently the creators of Sword Art Online abridged also don't like Sword Art Online, which makes sense. Uh, I probably don't think there are many people on the planet who actually like Sword Art Online. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things I liked about Yu-Gi-Oh! abridged and Dragon Ball abridged is that the creators so clearly had a deep affection for the original material. Um, you know, they, they made these things because... They loved those shows, but they recognized things that were silly about them. Like, that was that was what made them fun to watch. They weren't mean-spirited. They were very, like, you know, we all like this thing so much that we are willing to basically rewrite all the bits that we like to be cool and punchy and, like, make jokes about it because this takes up so much space in our heads. Um, but I also saw my share of, like, a bridge series that would, like, start and then, like, stop after a few episodes because it would just be like, hey, we have a bunch of jokes at the expense of this show, and once we run out of them, there's no more material. Um, which is why, like, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! Bridge works because it's like, yes, we're playing a children's card game for the fate of the world. Haha, -ha. it is funny, and it is kind of funny every time we do it, but there are other jokes, you know? There's other stuff that they can make fun of. Um, Oh, yes, and Helsing Abridged, that's another really good example. That one was really interesting because, of course, it was one episode a year, and that meant you could really see the improvement from episode to episode. Uh, and the improvement was pretty spectacular. Uh, and also, like, that's a case where 
I I watched the original Helsing OVA series, and it's good. I mean, it is. It's well done, kind of. Uh, but it's a case where I I almost feel like the abridged series treats itself more like a second draft after the first couple episodes than it does like a parody. You know, it is a parody, but it also basically just retells the story in a funnier, less incredibly dark and unpleasant way that cuts out a few plot holes that didn't make much sense. Like, I <clears throat> I know that, you know, the creators of a bridge series do not like people to say, hey, this is better than the original, because it's like the bridge series would not exist without the original. It exists to sort of mirror and mock the original. It's like a court jester, you know? It wouldn't have any material if the king and queen weren't there. So I understand that, but I, I enjoyed the experience of watching through Helsing Ultimate Abridged more than I enjoyed watching through the Helsing Ultimate OVAs. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of, I, I guess that's that's my thesis on Abridged series. I like them, but that's mostly because the good ones are the ones that survived. Um, okay, uh, let's see. <laughs> Seven Deadly Sins. Um, I watched through... A bunch of seven deadly sins and i i don't mean this in a mean way but i sort of had this this epiphany while i was watching it around like the fifth time the main character like got cartoonishly pervy on the main lady's boobs and i was like hey i just realized i don't ever like it when a show does this and if i don't like it I don't need to keep watching. <laughs> and I fully stopped watching. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you the only other show that made me come to that exact same conclusion, and it was High School of the Dead, <laughs> which is notorious in anime watching circles for many things, but most notably that one scene that I think everyone has at this point seen gift, where a bullet travels across a battlefield leading to as many gratuitous boob jiggle physics and panty shots as it's possible for a single bullet trajectory to lead to. And here's the thing. High School of the Dead is a zombie apocalypse. As mentioned, I hate zombie apocalypses. And the zombie apocalypse part of the story is played incredibly straight. It's deeply haunting and gross, very upsetting. Uh, and also, the camera will not stop zooming in up the skirts and on the chests of all the female protagonists. And I, like, <laughs> I am so used to mentally blocking that stuff out that I was, like, doing it without even noticing. Like, I was like, oh, man, it's so horrifying how, like, their zombie gym teacher ate their friend's face or whatever. And then, like, the camera would be fully up someone's butt. And I'm like, all right, get out of the way. Where's the helicopter we're waiting for? Um, and I think around the time that I realized I was going to stop watching <laughs> is when they're, like, They've, they've managed to make it to the roof of the school, and it looks like they're going to get out. They're, like, like waiting for the rescue chopper, and then they see the rescue chopper go down and explode, and the camera is fully up one of the female lead's butts the entire time, and I was like, I am trying to focus on their deep-seated grief and terror now that their one escape route has been cut off. Can you please stop showing me her underwear? <laughs> And around that time, I was like, I think I'm good, actually. And I just fully stopped watching. So, um, yeah, I guess Seven Deadly Sins was me developing higher standards for myself than that. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> um, yeah, I I don't understand, like, I, I don't understand what kind of person would be able to watch something that grotesquely unpleasant and then be able to focus on the boobs, you know? Like... I feel like it would just produce some very unpleasant cognitive dissonance. <sighs> Let's see. Oh my god, why do I keep drinking this tea? It's so spicy and weird now. Um, uh, everyone's just listing names of anime I have not watched. Uh, I have watched several of the Loop in the Third movies, and I really like them, but it's very funny how they're all clearly written by completely different people. Um, I, uh, 
So the first one I watched was probably the last one I should have watched, uh, Castle of Cagliostro, the one that was done by Studio Ghibli before it was Studio Ghibli. So it's got great animation, obviously, but it also apparently has a very weird tone by Lupin the Third Standards in that it's a little more melancholy and the main cast is a little bit more heroic than they are typically. And like, they kind of don't do the, the goofy gadgets stuff so much, um, and I didn't really understand what people meant by that until I watched, like, literally any other loop in the third movie. And I was like, oh, no. No, I get it. Okay. Um, so I think that the two others I'd seen was there's one where it's, like, the bad guy thing they're trying to stop is a full-on gray goo scenario. It's like a nanite apocalypse, like, legitimately. And they just play that part completely straight. So I don't know what was up with that. Um... And then the other one I watched is the recent one, the 3D animated one that's uh, basically just, like, Indiana Jones, the first one, but, like, it's Lupin the Third this time. And instead of the arc, it's, like, a black hole gun that shoots black holes. Um, but the movie's good, and I liked it. Uh, I feel like I've watched other movies with Lupin the Third, but, you know, they're all kind of... They sort of blur together. They're all sort of wacky heists with, you know, a colorful cast of characters. Like, they're all good. I think, but, you know, after a while, it's like, all right, that's wacky. Um, let's see. Any of the Godzilla movies? I hope you mean the live action ones, uh, because yes, I've watched the original one, which is terrifying and heartbreaking. And I've watched several of the extremely campy sequels <laughs> where they were like, sure, Godzilla is an incredibly poignant exploration of the scars on our collective consciousness left by nuclear war and stuff like that. But you know what would be fun? If we saw him dropkick a giant monkey! Woo! So, <laughs> I love those movies. They're all so stupid. I've been watching a lot more, like, Mystery Science Theater 3000 recently. Uh, and just watching them, like, watch Gamera movies is like, boy, this really is what Godzilla wrought, huh? This, this is what we got. Fantastic. Um, uh, I did watch Madoka. Um... I actually recently rewatched a little bit of it because I was using it as, an, uh, it as an example in a trope talk that I, again, will not spoil. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's good. It's sad. It's very sad. Um, but it's a very effective little miniseries that, like, starts and ends exactly where it needs to. I know they've done more stuff with it since then. I haven't watched it, and I don't feel the need to. So <clears throat> we're good. Whew. I'm gonna have more of my gross spicy tea. Ooh, is that a Columbo I see? Is that an excuse for me to talk more about more Columbo, my boy Columbo? What is there to say about Columbo that I haven't already said in the detective's trope talk? I really like it. It's funny. <laughs> um, I don't know. Columbo's very fun. Uh, I think at this point I've sort of rewatched it enough that I'm like, I get it. Um, you know, like... It's got the problem of all mysteries where, like, once you've watched it, like, twice, once where you don't know the solution and once where you do, it's like, all right, I'm good. So I need to, like, let it sit. I need to let it lie fallow for, like, a year or so before I rewatch it. And I'm like, oh, that was good. I remember. Um, but, yeah, if you are a fan of, like, it's not really a procedural. It's kind of very much its own thing. Um, I guess if you really like the part of the, like, murder mystery where the detective is, like, explaining how they found out how the bad guy did it and the bad guy has their third act breakdown and you wish that was basically the entire length of the show, then you should watch Columbo <laughs> because it starts with us seeing the murder and then we sort of follow around <clears throat> in the murderer's back pocket as Columbo slowly but surely picks them apart. Because, like, one thing I like about it is that it's pretty clear that, like, Columbo figures out what actually happened almost immediately with like preternatural speed and cunning but he never says anything unless he's absolutely certain he can prove it so i don't know it's a lot of fun like it, sometimes i watch procedurals and it stresses me out when someone's like throwing out accusations that i know they can't back up and now they've like added a ticking clock or whatever um but i like that in colombo it's just like he will only say like you know and then you killed him if he's about to prove exactly how he can prove it in a court of law. So, <clears throat> definitely recommend. 
uh, it's described by the creator, this person in chat is correct, as a how catch him rather than a who done it. Uh, because we see who did it and how they did it and how exactly they covered it up. And then we get to see Columbo like spot the one or two things they missed and then go from there. <coughs> okay. Um, whew, what, tea, what tea am I drinking? It's like this lemon ginger turmeric stuff. Uh, it's not great, <laughs> but I have a full pot of it and it scours the back of the throat pretty good. So, you know, whatever. Oh, man. Uh, is anyone here keeping up on A Court of Fae and Flowers, uh, the currently running Dimension 20, like, miniseries? I have never in my life cared about a Jane Austen period romance, but I am so invested in watching this goblin captain and this mermaid person kiss. <laughs> so definitely check it out. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's like they're hybridizing Jane Austen, or they're hybridizing D&D 5th edition with, like... <clears throat> a game system specifically for Jane Austen period dramas. And <laughs> it's got these very funny little points of like, oh, those don't work together very well. So like uh, Emily Axford's character has the spell Gift of Gab that allows her to take back the last thing she said, which in a period drama game is the most busted ability you can possibly have. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, and also I think it's like a masterclass on character driven game running. Uh, so like episode three just came out and I have no idea what Abria Angar's initial plan for this episode was, because everything that happens in it is a consequence of just the character-driven, like, beginning phase, where they're all, like, writing letters and spreading rumors. So, that's wild. And, uh, I think, like, if you're interested in games that aren't kind of stock D&D, albeit this is still a D&D game, and if you're interested in DMing styles from different DMs, just for, like, research purposes, it's a very fun watch. But also, it's just, like, a fun watch. So everyone should check it out. Uh, oh, boy. <clears throat> uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, interesting question in chat from Queen of Sparrows about uh, whether or not I'm planning on making a video focusing on the heart of the five-man band. Um, and I've sort of been going back and forth on this in a while. Uh for a while because the the problem is like the heart character calling them the heart was sort of my generous interpretation because the official term for them on tv tropes is the chick and for a very long time this was almost universally accurate they are in older cases the only member of the five-man band who is typically a girl and this often means that they have a personality that boils down to the only girl. And of course, that is a meaningless statement, but somehow it had all these tropes associated with it. Um, and as a result, you know, if you look at that stage of the character's development, there's almost nothing there. Like, it's almost categorically bad flat writing of like, we included a token girl... Uh, and she's going to be the hero's love interest, and she's probably going to get kidnapped a whole bunch. Okay, that's good. Cool. Um, and she didn't have any identifying character traits. The only thing that defined her place in the party was only girl, and that meant she didn't have to have any personality traits or, like, a role in the story outside of that. So describing it as the heart instead, which is something that more recent stories have done in a bigger way and produced more interesting characters sort of allows you to, like, narrow in on what actually defines the heart's role in the party. They tend to be the one who's, like, the most emotionally intelligent. They're the one who, like, mediates conflict between the other characters. The fact that these characters also are frequently the only girl <laughs> can actually lead to some, like, unfortunate stereotypical overlaps of, like, oh, of course the only girl has to also be the team mom to all these immature boys, and it's like, all right, whatever, man, you know, you could write literally anything else. Um, so essentially this trope has something there, but it's new. It's like a little seedling growing out of the pile of shit that this trope used to be. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I don't even know if that metaphor holds up. It's just as soon as the visual hit me, I had to say it. Um, cause the heart trope is a legitimate thing now. Like, you know, if, if you're like unpacking like she five man band, Bo is the heart and he's the only boy in the group. Anyway, um, you know, there are layers to it, and the heart role in the group is more than just, like, 
the one who like mothers everybody. You can also say that it's the character who kind of maybe serves as the group's conscience or like holds them together or is the one that everybody in the group cares about in a way they don't necessarily care about the others so much. Um, and there's stuff you can do there. I'm just not sure if I can in good conscience make a trope talk about it that isn't mostly me saying here's how this trope can work if you do it according to my 10-step program you know because I'm, I'm not trying to tell people the way they absolutely must write you know I, I'm trying to unpack ways that this character has been written and I so rarely encounter heart characters that are actually like super interesting i mean it's like you got Bo, you got katara you know there's others but like it's it's a bit of a hoist there's you know like filling out examples in the lancer trope talk is the easiest thing i've ever had to do <laughs> and like the powerhouses one similarly easy i don't want to just spend the entire heart trope talk complaining that there's been systemic misogyny present in certain tropes that just kind of has sat there unchallenged for a while and is only recently being un, un you know unraveled because you know that's the kind of subject that i could probably make the point for in one sentence but then the odds of me getting mad and making the point again for another like two paragraphs are not small i you know i i need to write it carefully and I still genuinely don't know if there's enough there. Like, if I have a thesis beyond, it would be nice if this character was, like, more of a thing more often. Um, so basically, I'm still kind of unpacking it myself. But I do hope to... Uh, sorry, uh, mid 2000s Teen Titans Starfire uh, is a good example that sort of is on, like... Is, like, an evolutionary missing link between being the chick and being the heart. Because she is the chick. She's not the only girl on the team. Raven is also there, but compared to the two, Starfire, like, she's the one who, like, appreciates more traditionally girly things. She likes the idea of going shopping and, and such like, and she's very joyous and happy and nurturing, uh, whereas Raven has a bit, like, more of, like, a tomboy vibe or whatever, uh, which is, like, that, that's a thing you'd find in the early 2000s where they're like, we have two girls, but one of them is kind of one of the dudes. It's, I don't know, man. People are weird. Um, but she is also, like, unconditionally the heaviest hitter on the team you know she's an absolute ass kicker she's a flying brick uh so she's very nice and sweet and pink and then also she kicks more ass than everybody else uh so she is an interesting character but then it's like what role does she play in the group um she's nice and she doesn't really understand earth very much and she's robin's love interest and sometimes she hits things very hard hey ludo history it's not my fault Chat brought up Teen Titans again. I didn't loop this back. Uh, oh, yes, and also Starfire is a literal princess. She's a, she's a pink princess with a great attitude, and she's cute and a love interest for the hero. And also she kicks a lot of ass and doesn't understand metaphors. So it's like we hybridized, like, Princess Peach and Drax the Destroyer, and it's great. And, like, the thing is, her characterization in the comics doesn't really have any of those like traditional chick qualities she's you know i mean she's like a supermodel but she's also she's got like a very tragic backstory that she's very stoic about and she's kind of like the tamaranians in the comics are like a proud warrior race kind of like klingons um and she's kind of just like very indicative of that and she's also like six foot something with just a huge amount of hair and she sort of towers over everybody else and is this very like noble alien royalty kind of situation so the fact that she's kind of a, a goober who doesn't understand metaphors and and doesn't really eat people foods in the cartoon is like if you really like her version in the comic you're probably not going to like so much her version in the cartoon and that, that's true of a lot of those characters but Anyway, it's it's interesting, you know, there is stuff there, but it's like I almost wonder if the trope at its at its at its heart is maybe a little bit it, maybe it needs to be reshuffled in the same way that rather than talking about the big guy, I talked about the powerhouse because like if you talk about the big guy trope, it's like, "Haha, these guys are often large and enjoy food." And it's, "Ah, yeah, the only example I need is Hunk from Voltron." Woo! And, you know, it's, it's talking about the powerhouse instead got to discuss a more interesting 
facet of this character. And I think there's a lot to be said for decoupling this trope from its role in the five-man band. I think I'm convincing myself that this is actually a workable trope talk as we're talking. I think if we sort of give it the powerhouse treatment and talk about the character who is the emotional core of the group, whatever group that is, I think we can probably unpack that in an interesting way. Oh, boy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whew. Mm. Live action Titans, the show nobody thought was going to be good uh, because of the trailer where Robin says, fuck Batman, um, turned out to, at least the season I saw, be kind of enjoyable. Like, it was weirdly edgy in unnecessary places, but it also did a lot of stuff that I liked. So I don't know. It was weird. Um, there's one absolutely hilarious moment uh, where Robin is getting, he's like at a, I don't know, at like a, like an art show that his friend Dinah is at. And uh, this guy comes up and like clearly kind of flirts with him a little bit and he just fully doesn't pick it up, sort of says something that fully alienates the guy. And then is, after the guy leaves, he's like, I wonder what Penguin's doing right now. And then it just smash cuts away, not to Penguin, but to some other stuff. And I was like, this is the Dick Grayson energy I wanted. This is the distracted himbo accidentally attracting everyone around him energy that I wanted. And then the rest of the show was like, eh, so whatever. <clears throat> <sighs> oh no, Titans got worse. That's a bummer. But also not surprising. Uh, I was shocked that it was good at the beginning. And uh, I don't know why it existed in the first place. Anyway. Um, oh boy. Um, I mean, I can talk about Leverage Redemption. It's basically Leverage but more. And Leverage is good, so it is also good. Uh, what I will say for Leverage Redemption is that when I watched through it, or at least the first season, I was like, heck yeah, that's as good as the original. And then I went back and I watched some bits of the original and I was like, ooh, it's actually kind of better than the original in places. So I, I, I think that's probably the highest praise I can give it. It felt so much like the original that I didn't notice the parts of it that were marked improvements. Uh, but there are marked technical improvements in parts of the characterization, some jokes that just, like, don't fly today that wouldn't get made. Um, anyway, I'm going to drink a little bit of tea, because Ludo History just told me to stop and drink water, and tea is all I have. Oh my god, why is it so gross tasting? This stuff better be medicinal. Ah, all right. Oh, man, that's really bad. Uh, what's going on? Um, uh, ooh, do I get to talk about Transformers Prime? I do like Transformers Prime. Um, I was not, like, a big Transformers kid. Uh, okay, guys, look, the, the, the tea that I have... It's in one of those, like, it, it's loose leaf. It's in one of those loose leaf diffuser teapots. So it just keeps steeping, okay? So it just gets, like, more intensely whatever it is as I leave it alone. And because I'm drinking it so slowly, <laughs> there's so much more of it getting more intense. It's not my fault. That's what it's designed to do. The tea is working as it's supposed to. It's just bad. Anyway, Transformers Prime... <laughs> I was never, like, a big Transformers kid. I definitely missed the boat on, like, G1 or whatever it's called. Uh, didn't read the comics. Uh, basically did not watch any Transformers Prime until somebody on Twitter uh, recommended an episode. I think I did, like, an ob I Back when I was still tweeting oddly specific tropes of the day, uh, I mentioned kind of liking, like, the, the stock episode where, like, a bad guy is like, now I hunt the most dangerous prey. And, you know, the main character is like on the run from some super dangerous hunter. And someone was like, oh, hey, they do that in this episode of Transformers Prime and like said the specific episode. And I was like, I'm bored. I'll just look up this random episode and watch it. And I watched it and it was good. And I watched the entire rest of the show from the beginning. <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, props for getting me hooked on the one episode with a trope that I would really like, so props. Uh, and that was kind of the only Transformers media I liked until Bumblebee came out, like the movie, and I watched that, and I liked it too, and then like two days later I realized it was just Iron Giant again. Um, 
which I liked, so it made sense. But the thing I think is most impressive about Transformers Prime is the way it characterizes Optimus, uh, because the core of his characterization, according to the voice actor, uh, is that Optimus is strong enough to be gentle. And I think that that is, first of all, just an absolutely beautiful turn of phrase, and second of all, a really good core to build a character around. Like, a character who is so powerful and competent that they can at every turn afford to be gentle and kind and give people chances and try to, you know, do things in the most kind way possible. Uh, because in some level, like, if you, if you think about it that way, like, there's almost a privilege to that. Like, I, I feel like, I think maybe I heard that, like, the movie Parasite talked about this, that, like, if you're, like, a certain level of, like, privileged or wealthy or something, it's really easy for you to be nice because it, like, doesn't cost you anything. Um, and it's almost like, in this case, there's, like, a, there's a privilege to being that powerful that you aren't on the defensive because very few things can actually hurt you. Uh, and I think that that is just a very interesting core to build this Paragon leader character around. Um, and it's also, I think it's really easy to make a Paragon like that boring. The thing is, I like Paragons in general, so I don't trust it when people say that they're boring. But in this case, it's like, he's the leader, and he's lawful good, and he does the right thing. And it would be so easy to keep the character just there. Um... And instead, they don't do that. They do other stuff with him. There are, like, these adorable little moments of comedy where, like, he he's always polite, but, like, there's... <laughs> they've got, like, a token human ally, uh, Agent Fowler, I want to say, um, who, like, basically pops up to be like, oh, we found Decepticons, like, at this location, get in there and and rescue the, the innocents or whatever, but make sure nobody sees you because your robot's in disguise. And there's, like, a bit... Uh, where he's, he comments that, like, all right, and it's happening in, like, northern Scotland, so everyone better pack your kilts, and then he leaves, and then, like, one of the other bots who's, like, a, I think it's Ultra Magnus or someone else who's, like, not normally on the team is, like, what is a kilt? And Optimus, like, looks confused for a second, and then just kind of leans over and is, like, Agent Fowler can at times be oblique. I find it best to simply nod and mobilize. <laughs> and just, like, the idea that this, like, 150-foot-tall robot man is, like, I don't understand that reference, but I don't want to be rude, so I'm just going to nod and hope he doesn't press the issue. <laughs> it's just absolutely delightful to me. And there's a lot of adorable moments like that. Um, I don't know. I think it's great. Also, that show has an absolutely spectacular Megatron and a great Starscream, and they sort of have this, like, great dynamic where... Obviously, the thing with Starscream is he is always trying to backstab Megatron and connive his way to the top... And the problem is, if Megatron at any point seems surprised at this, it makes Megatron seem very stupid. So just the mere act of having Starscream around can kind of undercut Megatron's villainy. But in this case, it's like, Megatron knows that Starscream is doing this and doesn't consider him a threat because he isn't. And like the few time, like the one time he actually goes far enough that Megatron's like, okay, it's not funny anymore. He like kicks the shit out of him and fully throws him out of the Decepticons and like would have killed him if he hadn't turned into a jet and sped away. So it really just kind of serves to make Megatron seem scarier because he's like, yeah, I know you've been plotting my downfall, but it wasn't actually annoying enough to make me do anything about it until now. And it's like, oh God. So this show's just really good at making you buy that these characters are what they are supposed to be. That Optimus is like a completely careful, excellent leader, father to his men, very well put together, kind to absolutely everybody and compassionate all the way down. And that Megatron is this terrifying force of nature that really can only be matched by Optimus. Like, the fact that, like, their size differential is so much more ridiculous than in other media kind of helps because Megatron and Optimus are basically the only bots that are that size and everyone else is rather smaller than them. So whenever it's anyone else versus either of them, it's like, all right, whatever, where's your boss? That's the only way this is going to turn into anything. Um, it's got some great moments uh, I've talked about at various trope talks, uh, some of them in the finale that I don't want to necessarily spoil, but, oh man, just a good show. I feel like the only thing I can say about it that wasn't great is that, like, 
at the beginning, I feel like maybe the studio was like, it needs to be about the human kids. And they're like, okay, we can throw in some human kids, but like all the best characterization stuff is about the bots. So I don't really know why the kids are there after a while. Um, anyway, uh, oh, Predaking is also great. Uh, he's like a season three thing. Uh, and I love the way they do his arc. Uh, so basically they sort of established that, uh, like way back in the day, they like sent a bunch of like, <laughs> like prototypical, like, like pre-evolutionary transformers, like monsters that were like the inspiration for legendary monsters, uh, which is why season three has the subtitle Beast Hunters, I want to say. So it's like, oh, you have like Legends of the Hydra. It's because w there was like a robot Hydra around, but now he's dead and fossilized. And then they like get this like Decepticon scientist who's like, yes, I've been cloning those dudes. And they just clone this fucking like robot dragon, this like Transformers dragon, uh, which is great because the humans are like, oh my God, a dragon. And the Transformers are like, the fuck is a dragon? Because <laughs> it's like, that's not what they call it. Um, and, uh, it can't transform, you know, it's not, it's not like a transformer. It's just a robot dragon. Uh, and it can't talk cause it's a dragon, but for a couple episodes, like when it's hanging out with the Decepticons, it's like kind of clear that it's paying more attention to stuff than the Decepticons notice. And then at one point, like, I don't even remember what triggers. I think Starscream who's been kind of insulting it and like hitting it and stuff, uh, says something. And then like at one point it sees Starscream transform into a jet and it has this like moment of like kind of head tilt, like interesting. And then like an episode later, it transforms into like a humanoid form. That's like a full head and shoulders taller than Megatron and can talk and isn't very happy about the way Starscream specifically has been treating it. And is like, uh, Hey, like I'd love to help you, uh, take over the world, my liege. And meanwhile, Megatron, like, facing the only being he's ever seen that can actually, like, easily take him in a fight is like, I, uh, yes, I'll be right back. <laughs> and is like, scrap the cloning program. If they can all transform, we're fucked. <laughs> um, and, um, I don't know. I just, it, it was really good, like, visual storytelling and characterization with completely no verb, like, no words because he couldn't talk until then. Uh, so yes, it's a cool show with a lot of really good stuff in it. So, uh, if you haven't watched it already and you're interested in Transformers, I would recommend it. Um, uh, let's see. Soundwave is also great. Uh, he, uh, he's kind of just like a Slenderman robot. He's got really long arms because he turns into like a stealth fighter or something. Anyway, um... All right, let me drink more of this absolutely disgusting, but probably medicinal or something tea. Blech. Okay, great. Um, <sighs> over the Garden Wall. I will always go to bat for Over the Garden Wall. It has become my uh, my October ritual to rewatch the whole thing because it's just so seasonal. It's uh, It's got that perfect vibe that I love. Um, and also... I like that it maps perfectly to the circles of hell and Dante's Infernal. It, look, if I take the diffuser out of the tea, then I gotta put it somewhere. And I'm recording now. I can't exactly put, like, soggy tea leaves down somewhere. Anyway, everyone should watch Over the Garden Wall. It's really, uh, really weird. <laughs> like, the entire cast are, like, opera singers, except for the main character, who is Elijah Wood, and his little brother, who's played by, like, an actual nine-year-old. Um, I don't know why it's like that either, but it's very fun. Oh, God, don't make me talk about Reboot Season 4. Why would you make me talk about the one season that's bad? <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Put in more diffusers. That's not happening. The, the, the tea kettle's not built for that. Um. Oh, jeez. I mean, like, I've seen Knives Out pop out a bunch. Knives Out is good. Uh, I don't want to spoil why it's good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hold on. Nobody panic. I'll destroy the bot. <clears throat> Theoretically. Oh, just kidding. Somebody got it first. Good job. Um, oh, stop. Why are you guys asking only about the bad shit that Reboot did? Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, why must you hurt me this way? Uh, but yeah, Knives Out is good, um, and I like that they're finally letting Daniel Craig play things that aren't James Bond. <laughs> um, uh, 
Let's see. I've seen a few things about uh, writing evil protagonists. Um, and that's an interesting question because there are... Mm, I don't know. A few stories I like that have evil protagonists. There are more stories I like that have villains that are sort of adequately characterized as the hero of their own story without being the protagonist of the story. Uh, and I think that tends to be easier to write because when you're doing a story with like an evil protagonist, it's like, you know, it's like a Death Note situation where it's like, I don't like this guy, but I'm very like entertained by whatever's wrong with him. And I would love to see how far he can take this before he absolutely spirals. Um, Kind of the same thing I like about Chicago, the musical, where it's like, everyone here is a terrible person, and I would love to watch their lives fall apart, so let's go. Um, and it's a little bit trickier when you have, like, you know, <laughs> characters like Kratos in the first three God of War games, where it's like, this guy's the bad guy. He's, like, objectively doing terrible stuff. Like, why are we, you know, but he's also framed in a sympathetic light where it's like, you know, he's being jerked around by fate and it's sad that this is happening, uh, which I don't think makes him not a villain protagonist, but it does kind of mean that we're talking about a lot of different tropes here. Uh, you know, a lot of stories with villain protagonists are stories where we're going to watch them lose in the end, uh, because honestly, stories with villain protagonists where they win in the end aren't generally very satisfying to watch, like... Either they're not so villainous that, like, we're still kind of rooting for them to succeed, or, you know, they are villainous and they get everything they wanted, and then they're like, oh, but will I ever be truly happy on my throne of skulls? And it's like, I don't fucking know. I guess we'll never know, because in this story you want everything and you're fine. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot here. Uh, I guess... A lot of the villains that I like best are the ones that are framed as essentially the protagonists of their own story. I will constantly talk about how good Kung Fu Panda 2 is uh, <laughs> and why Lord Shen is one of the best villains. And a lot of that is because he's so clearly the hero of his own story. He's like playing out a classic like prophecy of downfall that you accidentally make exactly happen story arc, which I love, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I did watch through all of Death Note, even if it's like three different shows in a trench coat and i really only liked like the first and second no the first one i guess um anyway uh how, how about kung fu panda 3 kung fu panda 3 is fine but it definitely ended when it was supposed to you know it was like fine uh dracula in castlevania was the example i was thinking about before that i fully lost in the chat uh very much the protagonist of his own story, and also purposefully framed as a foil to Trevor Belmont, who is the actual protagonist. Like, the fact is, on paper, and very purposefully framed that way in the show, Dracula and Trevor Belmont have almost exactly the same tragic backstories and the same tragic motivation. They just bubbled in opposite answers on the should humanity live YN option. Um, so Dracula's whole thing of, like, you know, the only person I cared about was horribly murdered by the church and by ignorant people who let it happen, even though she just wanted to help them, and that's terrible, and so they all deserve to die. And then you look at Trevor, who's like, yeah, my family home was burned by the church and by scared people who we all just wanted to protect, and, you know, I've got nothing, and my reputation's been dragged through the mud, and I'm alone, and everything sucks— but I guess I'll still protect these people from these fucking hellspawn because, you know, I guess it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, and, you know, like, over and over again, we see Dracula in this very sympathetic light. I mean, like, he spends a half of season two, like, slumped in front of his fireplace in a depressive funk while Trevor's off, like, forming the ultimate polycule and having a great time with his new best friends and girlfriend and maybe boyfriend and it's just fantastic for everybody uh and uh at the beginning of which one is it uh when trevor saves the speakers uh by basically convincing the angry mob of manipulated innocent people to not murder a bunch of innocent people it's kind of the crux of the issue where basically dracula's entire thesis is there were innocents before Lisa died, but after that, none of them are innocent anymore because none of them stopped her senseless killing. Um, whereas Trevor is like, hey, this crowd of innocent people you've whipped into a frenzy, 
uh, you, the person who's actually like maliciously trying to direct this to happen, this person would have made murderers out of these innocent people, but he's the only one who's actually doing anything evil. And basically, Trevor tells the innocent people, like, what's actually going on and gives them the choice to do something about it. And they do, categorically proving that his worldview is more correct than Dracula's because he's like, hey, well, Dracula's like, none of them are innocent anymore, so they should all be killed. They should all be executed. Um, and then meanwhile, Trevor's like, they can always choose to do the right thing if they know what the right thing is. The problem is not that they are, you know, cruel or senseless or animals. The problem is that they are ignorant and it is our duty to help them not be that anymore. And that's a thesis throughout the entire show. That's Lisa's entire raison d'etre. She just wants people to not live short, scared lives where they don't understand what's hurting them. She's a doctor and Sif is the exact same way. Trevor and Alucard both have like huge libraries of knowledge that nobody else has access to. And the end of the show is basically them opening that up so people can learn from them. The entire secret thesis of the show is, hey, People can be better if we teach them to be better. And it's great. It's a fantastic bit. And it's an excellent, like, foil dynamic between... <laughs> Every time I say Trevor and Dracula, I'm forced to confront that I'm saying the phrase Trevor and Dracula in all sincerity and that I'm comparing a character named Dracula with a character named Trevor. <laughs> and I wonder if they did that on purpose just to fuck with me. Anyway... Point is, is a really good show. Uh, and the reason why Dracula works as such a sympathetic character is because the show is really good at showing us that, like, self-destructive or, like, villainous or angsty behavior is, like, actively unhealthy. Um, like, <laughs> someone on Tumblr asked me about this the other day, which is why it's kind of fresh in my mind. But, like, when you look at Alucard's entire character arc, at any point when he's at his most, like, aloof loner, is also when he is at his least sexy because he stops, like, showering and stuff. And it sort of tacitly helps reinforce that, like, playing the cool, aloof loner is not actually as glamorous and cool as it seems. And there's, like, a, a minimum level of, like, human socialization that people need before they start kind of self-destructing. <laughs> and I don't know. I, I think that the show takes such a candid approach to the mental health of so many characters that you wouldn't normally see that getting unpacked for. Like Dracula, who spends the entirety of season two in a depressive funk until Trevor shows up and he, like, reboots and is like, oh, I know how to handle this. Cool. Um, and then, like, there's that little moment in season four that really endeared me to it when, like, it's been, like, one episode after the other of just nonstop prepping stuff. And then, like, Trevor and Sypha get, like, a moment alone and they're like, this has been a lot, right? Let's just, like, sit down and, like, fucking talk through how we're feeling about some of this stuff and, like, what we're wanting and, like, how we're going to handle this going forward. And I, I'm i just always so impressed when a show or, a, like, a story in general is willing to sort of, like, sit down and be like, hey, a lot of shit just happened. Like, a lot of plot stuff just went down. Um... How about we have a little denouement and we, like, unpack some of that and how we feel about it. You know, a little downtime where we let it actually process into our characterization before we just go rushing off into the next adventure. And um, it's so hard to do that. It's so hard to pace that out because it's really scary to slow a story down and to focus entirely on the characters and to let the strength of the characters carry it. But when you pull it off, it's really good. And uh, Castlevania does that well. The show, anyway. Um... But yes, uh, Castlevania had no right being as good as it was, and every day I am thankful that it was that good. And I've been planning to do a full rewatch at some point when I really need to make video progress. Um, oh boy, uh, what do I think of the recent seasons of Young Justice? Oh buddy, <laughs> I don't know if you... Uh... Here's the thing, I can't answer that specific question because I have not watched Young Justice since the very beginning of season three. And I'll tell you why, because uh, I've said this before at different occasions, I don't want to, like, retread exclusively old ground. Um, that was a very quick ban, by the way. Nice work. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, damn it. 
chat is scrolling so quickly that I cannot permaban this friggin'. All right, whatever. We'll deal with it. Anyway, uh, so here's the thing. I was one of those people who absolutely loved season one of Young Justice. Season one of Young Justice has almost nothing in common with any later season of Young Justice. So the fact that I was the perfect target audience for season one kind of means that every later season appealed to me less. This is just how it goes. It's how it works. Uh, this is the danger whenever you majorly shift an element of your story status quo. And Young Justice season one I really liked. I haven't rewatched it in a while, but I absolutely loved it when it first came out. It was one of those shows where, like, I caught one episode randomly with no context, and it was the episode, what's it called, uh, Homefront, maybe? Uh, where the, like, the cave gets invaded by, like, a, like, a brainwashed sort of, like, red tornado and siblings, and everyone except Robin and Artemis get captured, and it's just them doing, like, Die Hard in the cave. And it's, it's just an episode where Artemis really comes into her own. I saw this with no context. I didn't know who any of these characters were, and I was so fascinated that I looked it up, and I was like, oh my god. The show is so good! Um, and then season two has a five-year time skip. Breaks up basically every major character dynamic that they established in the first season. Establishes a full-blown miscommunication-based idiot plot where the characters don't talk about something that they really should have talked about. And then the entire back half of the season only happens because they didn't talk about this. Specifically, they didn't tell the team's psychic with no boundaries who reads minds all the time. They didn't tell her that. And somehow she didn't find out from whatever. It's fine. Um, and then the main thing is that like the show stops focusing on the main characters that we got invested in in season one because they're all broken up and weird and time skipped and some of them have retired because that's what I want to see in season two of a show I really liked. Uh, they focus mostly on Blue Beetle and Impulse, two characters completely new to the second season. And also... Like, five million other secondary characters they introduced. They pulled, uh, like, um... You know that thing they did in Teen Titans Season 5? But it, like, worked because we'd already had four seasons of really good stuff before that. So it was okay that they kind of expanded the cast. Uh, they tried doing that with only one season of Goodwill. And it didn't work for me. I know some people who really liked it. I was not one of them. So I was just kind of like, okay, whatever. And then it got canceled. It got canceled after two seasons, and I saw so many people being heartbroken, and I was like, honestly, I'm kind of glad they killed it before it got worse. And then they resurrected it for season three, and it got worse. So, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, and I, I, think, I think it was season three that came back, and everyone was so excited because it's like, oh, oh, man, it's like it's on a different platform now. So... Uh, they can, like, do shit on there that they couldn't do when it was, like, on, like, serialized television, you know? Like, they can they can swear, and they can show blood and stuff. And I was like, I, um, did they want to do either of those things? Okay. And then I saw the first couple episodes, and I was like, oh, they really, really wanted to do both of those things. They really wanted to swear, and they really wanted to brutally murder people on screen. Cool. You know what? I didn't really want to see that, especially in the context of this fun kid superhero show, allegedly. So I think I'm good. And I just kind of checked out and stopped watching it. And uh, all I've seen is people who I'm pretty sure are just being tricked <laughs> into continuing watching. Because here's what Young Justice did at the end of season two. For those of you who haven't seen it, basically throughout the entirety of season two, Kid Flash, who is the comic relief character for season one, he's kind of the team heart. He's funny, he's emotionally open, he's goofy, he has a great romance with Artemis. Uh, he's kind of retired throughout most of season two, and he comes out of retirement for one last run. Uh, and then in the finale, he quote-unquote dies. Uh, by which I mean, he is like zapped into the speed force. He like fades away, he cross fades out of existence. And if you're at all familiar with how DC Comics works... This is like a rite of passage for speedsters. Like, almost all of them have quote-unquote died and then turned out to just be in the speed force. Like, it's such a comic book death that nobody in their right mind would believe that it was a legitimate thing. But it's been two seasons and he's still dead. And I feel like the only people I saw who were still consistently watching it were just waiting for the showrunners to make the incredibly obvious not stupid writing decision 
and bringing back the one character that everybody liked. And I think the reason they didn't do that is because that way everyone will keep watching. <laughs> it's like he's the carrot they're dangling on a string in front of all of us. Like, oh, we'll bring back Wally West if we get one more season. Um, and it's just fucking stupid. It's like, if that perma kills him, like, of all the things that could have killed him, why the most ridiculous, unbelievable, you know, whatever, it's fine. I mean, that's one of those writing decisions where, like, it's it's like... It's like Schrodinger's writing decision, where it's like, if they fix it, then it was good writing. It was a fine little fake out. It was like scary and enabled some interesting character drama. And then we got the character back and we didn't waste all his development. But if it's not fixed, if that's actually permanent, if that's how they tried to kill like this major protagonist for literally basically no reason, in a way that they didn't need to do. Like, the explanation is, oh, he got his powers in a different way than, like, either of the other Flash guys that are currently helping him run really fast around the problem to make it go away. This is the main way that Flashes ever fix things, is like, well, we're going to run fast at it, and that'll fix it. And the explanation is he got his powers, like, by recreating the experiment in which Barry Allen got his powers. So he's not as fast as them. So the speed force is like, you are the weakest link, and, like, eats him. And of all the fucking ways to kill a superhero, like, that's some, that's a, that's an authorial backflip right there. Like, they, it takes some work to explain how that happens when he could have just, like, gotten shot or something. (laughs) I'm just saying if they wanted to kill him, they chose the the way that everyone believes they're going to fix and undo. And it's been two seasons with no sign of him coming back. And it's like, look, at this point, if they bring him back, I don't know even know what the point would be. It would probably just be in like the grand finale of season five, right before they get canceled forever. And it's like, oh, we got him. Or maybe we didn't. Ooh. So I don't know, man. I, I worry... I mean, I'm, I don't care about this too much. As It's been ages since I was invested in this show, but it is kind of sad for me to sort of see it turning into this thing that I'm so thoroughly uninvested in and and uh, squandering a character who I really liked. Uh, <laughs> the voice actor is even back. Like, the guy who voices him has voiced a bunch of other guys, um, including... Uh, uh silco in arcane like he's really good and has a lot of range but he also plays razor in green lantern the animated series and as i understand it razor cameoed in an episode like not even a cameo he just shows up as like a guest character in an episode of young justice in a more recent season so like the voice actors around they could bring him back it would be fine i don't know man whatever (laughs) um ugh and that kind of cameo, like, it it says something about how little I wanted to watch Young Justice because I really liked Green Lantern, the animated series, and I really liked Razor. I thought Razor was one of, like, the best new characters they'd made, even though it was so funny that transparently the point of Green Lantern, the animated series was to provide the bare minimum justification to explain this cute romance between two OCs <laughs> that aren't from the comics and are just around. And I thought that was very funny. It's like, we got Hal Jordan and Kilowog here to play chaperone, and here's the good stuff. Um, and, like, so Razor shows up in an episode of Young Justice without, as I understand it, sufficient context to know, you know, the two seasons worth of context you'd get from Green Lantern the Animated Series, which means the target audience of that episode is me. And, like, I don't know, the two dozen other people that watched that show before they canceled it after two seasons and left it on a cliffhanger. So, like, why wouldn't I want to watch that episode? Because I don't trust that show to treat my boy right. And that, to me, speaks to a fundamental failure of intent, of, like, they write a show, an episode of the show, so handcrafted for the demographic I specifically fill, and it doesn't even tempt me to watch it. And that might just be me personally being jaded and upset. But it also might just be like, you know, if you cultivate an audience and then you sort of pull the rug out from under it and then you're working with like 20% of the audience you had before and then you slowly and painfully build up a new audience and then you try to appeal to that old audience. I don't know. 
like obviously they're not like trying to metagame the perfect audience ratio nobody writes stories like that but like i don't know it's just weird to me and uh i'm, I'm still a little butthurt that i didn't get like four more seasons or three more seasons of the show that young justice was in season one because i would have been happy just seeing more of that and i also just feel like just from a basic technical level, if you have a show that is entirely carried on the strength of the characters and their dynamic with each other, which is what Young Justice Season 1 was, like, categorically, that was the entire appeal, and then you throw in a time skip, even if you come back to those same characters, if the entire appeal is those characters and their dynamic with each other, when you time skip it, you break the audience's sort of connection to that linear progression. Suddenly, the characters have undergone experiences the audience doesn't know about, which can be good for mysteries, but it can also just kind of be like, oh, well, the one thing I was immersed in, I have to get re-immersed in, and I might not like where these characters have ended up. And that is a risk. That essentially risks, you know, carving a chunk off your audience every time. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying not to be too negative about stuff in general. But you did ask. You, you pushed the button. And also, yes, as of today, I think they canceled Young Justice Season 5, which means Wally's dead forever. So, good work, team. Oh, boy. Drink some more of this absolutely gross tea. Oh, it's so bad. How is it getting worse? Um, let's see. I haven't watched The Expanse. Sorry. I, I've heard about it, but that's really all. Whew. Um, hmm. I've also not seen Black Clover, and I barely know about it. Sorry. Why am I still drinking it? Because it's there, man. What else am I supposed to do with it? Uh... <laughs> it's continuing to steep and cool. No, you don't understand. Like, the stuff in the pot is continuing to steep. The stuff in the cup is not connected to the, you know, the, the tea stuff and the strainer. So it shouldn't be getting worse. <laughs> oh, boy. Um... Opinions on Lilo and Stitch? Uh, Lilo and Stitch is really, really good. <laughs> and it's so fun how it absolutely hits different when you're a kid versus when you're an adult. Because when you're a kid, you're like, yeah, Lilo is fun. And Stitch is so cute and goofy. I would love to hang out with him. And then when you watch it as an adult, it's like, I'm sorry, the primary thread in this movie is that Lilo's going to be taken away by fucking child protective services because her and Nani's parents are dead and there's not sufficient social safety net to help them? What the fuck? And it's just heartbreaking. And then you're like almost glad for the alien deus ex machina where it's like, oh, we blew up your house, but don't worry, Mr. Bubbles actually knows about everything. And so you're going to be fine. Is like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Justice prevails. But um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, definitely heartbreaking. Uh, but also really cool. <sighs> okay. I refuse to believe you, person in comments, who says there's a Lilo and Stitch anime. I'm going to put this tea cup farther away, and I'm going to switch to my other drink, which is coffee. Let's go. Oh yeah, that's a lot less gingery. Okay, let's see. Uh, did I ever play Devil May Cry? Okay, I haven't played Devil May Cry, but I did undergo a pretty serious watching, like, full cutscene movie, no commentary playthroughs of video games in, like, I want to say early, mid-high school. And uh, various Devil May Cry games were on my list. Uh, up to and including, I want to say, DMC Devil May Cry might have been the first one I actually saw a playthrough of. And... <laughs> I know it's the one that everybody is embarrassed by now <laughs> because, of course, it was bad. Um, yeah, it's ginger tea. It's lemon, ginger, and turmeric tea. So it looks like something that would come out of a, like a, an industrial waste pipe um, and tastes, I don't know, like if you boiled potpourri, whatever. Anyway, 
Uh, so DMC Devil May Cry, which is the one where they make uh, Dante like a, a pouty high schooler, uh, you know, and then also completely changed their origins. Uh, I watched a full playthrough of that, and it was goofy and weird. Um, this was around the time when I was watching like cutscene movie playthroughs of all the Metal Gear games, so they all kind of blurred together in my head. Uh, don't think I actually liked any of them, but, you know, it was whatever. <laughs> Uh, tasty as shit, but so strong. I will respectfully disagree with you on the first half of that assessment. It's, um, I don't know. It's good for, like, sinus irrigation and, uh, could probably do a number on certain vampires if you splashed it at them, but I would not, uh, willingly drink more of this unless I really wasn't paying attention, which means the odds are good that I will before the end of this stream. Um, let's see. Uh, if people have opinions on Devil May Cry that I don't know enough about Devil May Cry to have opinions on. Uh, let's see. Trope video on multiverses. Honestly, I might, but I might also get all that out of my system in a detailed diatribe on why I don't like multiverses and timeline resets. Kind of depends on which format I think will be able to do it justice better. Um... Everyone's just sampling or giving me tea ideas. Uh, let's see. Let's get an update on that tea. Please hold while I pour myself another glass. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Yellower than ever. <sighs> Bad. Moving on. Uh, let's see. Portal and Portal 2 are good. In very different ways. I actually really liked Portal 2 as, like, an expansion on Portal, the first one. Um, because, of course, Portal was made from the cut corners of other games that Valve was making at the time. But then Portal was so big that, like, Portal 2 got an actual budget. And it was good. It was cool and I liked it. Uh, <laughs> and I liked how GLaDOS goes from just sort of, like, a completely personality-less, like, Disney villain to your best friend and i really like that development i like how she got like a little speed run vegeta treatment and that was cool um uh, let's see do i normally drink tea and coffee simultaneously no i had coffee earlier today uh and then when i was prepping for the stream i made tea because i foolishly thought it would be soothing and comfortable to drink uh, but I still had, like, half a mug of coffee sitting around because it's not as sweet as I normally make it. So, like, I don't mindlessly drink it. I, like, drink it and I'm like, ooh, it's bitter. And then I put it away and, like, forget about it for half an hour. Uh, so now I have a very cold cup of, like, coffee with milk in it. And I have a still slightly warm pot of very upsettingly yellow substance uh, that tastes like liquid pain. So, kind of a toss-up which of those I'm going to be drinking at any given moment, honestly. Um, Tremors is a great movie. Is that you, Indigo, slipping in under another name? I've never seen Tremors. Is that... Is that the one where, like, the whole premise is basically, hey, what if, like, the Shy Hulud from Dune were, like, a horror movie monster? Or whatever. Is that, is that, the, is that the vibe? I don't know why I'm asking, like, I know what this movie's about. Um... What if I mixed the tea and coffee? It would be the most revolting substance known to man. There's, like, milk in the coffee and, like, acidic substances in the tea. Okay, everybody knows what Tremors is. Fantastic. Uh, is it... Okay, everyone's saying it's fun or great. Does that mean it's good? <laughs> Tremors is a comedy... Is it a comedy? I can't tell if they're fucking with me on this. Um, <laughs> it has Kevin Bacon. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? I'm not going to mix the drinks and you all can't peer pressure me into this. It's not good, but it's incredibly fun. All right, that's that's pretty classic. I, I want to... I haven't done a good, bad movie night in a while. I've been sort of debating it. Oh, wait, no, uh... I rewatched Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets the other day uh, for a guest podcast appearance that won't be out for like another month and a half. So I think it's OK if I if I talk about the movie. Um, <clears throat> that movie's bad. <laughs> there we go. That's the that's the gist. No, I mean, like 
I, I was so disappointed by that movie. I wanted it to be good. I saw the trailer in theaters with my roommate, and we were like, oh, my God, like a, like a sci-fi space opera with such stunning, colorful visuals? Be still my heart. Could we finally be getting, like, a return to the sword and planet style of fantasy that we haven't seen since Star Wars spawned off a genre of its own? And, uh, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened was the movie is really good until the main characters start talking. <laughs> and that's a bad sign, isn't it? Uh, and it's, it's so frustrating because the world is genuinely so fascinating. And the first scene is incredibly good. And the second scene is incredibly good. Like, the first scene has no dialogue. It's only set to music. And the music is ground control to Major Tom. And the scene is essentially a time lapse, like a montage of the formation of the Alpha Station, the eponymous city of 1000 planets. Um, and it starts with like just two fairly contemporary Earth satellites, like a US one and a China one, linking up. And the astronauts float in from one to the other and they like hug each other. Link up more satellites, more satellites. Alien first contact happens, links up the satellite. Over and over, we see humanity extending a hand, and the hand is clasped and shaken, and the satellite grows, and the, the cultures expand, and it's beautiful. And basically, the only dialogue we get is like a little narration from like a, a newscaster that's like, the Alpha Station's so huge, it's posing a threat to Earth, we're gonna send it off into space, bye! And then it goes into space, and everyone's cool with that. And then the second scene is like, it takes place on this like idyllic, pearlescent abalone alien planet with big too good for this sinful world energy everyone is like constantly smiling beatifically and stretching and talking about their harmony with nature you know how it is you know this place is about to get burned to the ground and it's going to be super poignant um and it does obviously my correctness need not go stated but uh it gets burned to the ground because these like burning chunks of a spaceship fall through the atmosphere and it's clear that like at a scale these people can't even comprehend a space battle is happening in orbit around their planet like we have enough information to know to guess what's going on um and uh the character we've nominally been following this like princess this beatifically smiling happy pearl princess uh gets like stuck outside an accidentally sealed spaceship that the others take shelter in as a truly massive cruiser like crashes into the ocean and this shockwave of devastation ripples out from it uh and she can't get in and her father can't open the door to let her in and she sort of accepts her fate like tearfully and like walks towards the explosion as we as we see her like her skin like blacken and then she explodes in this burst of light and then our main character wakes up and the movie starts sucking and it's like no those are great scenes. Those scenes are incredible. Those are like, like, like the, that's two award-winning sci-fi short films smacked together. And then suddenly the movie's bad, like really bad. <laughs> and I tried to figure out why it was so painful because those first two scenes are so good. Like how can somebody write, uh, the, for those of you who just caught me mid-rant, the movie I'm discussing is Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. A bad movie I recently rewatched. And, ooh, baby, she no good at this point. Um, and I think part of what makes it terrible is the main two characters, uh, Valerian and Loreline, uh, their intro is like having to cram in so much information about them that their entire conversation is like camera A, camera B, like, as you know, Bob, like, we both know my military record is immaculate, nine years in the service. Also, the guy saying that, Valerian, is played by Dane DeHaan, who, despite being, like, 27 at the time, didn't really look like he was 27, so when he says, like, nine years of exemplary military service, I was like, in the fucking Boy Scouts? What are you talking about? Um, so that was kind of a problem. And I guess in the comic they're based on, they are not supposed to be, like, young, hot, teen adjacent beautiful 20 somethings or whatever they're supposed to actually kind of be people who could reasonably have a military record it's fine whatever so the problem is it's like it's a lot of very very transparently expository dialogue just a lot of like 
Oh, yes, well, we both know these traits about me, as you find me attractive for them. And then she's like, ah, yes, but we also know that you possess these negative character traits. And it's like, oh, man, can I sign up for another three hours of this shit, baby? Um, good lord. Uh, and then, like, I noticed, I had to sort of rewind the scene, because I noticed in the middle that it was a one take. It was like... They had these two, and it's not an impressive one take. They are walking down a hallway, some VFX are being projected around them, and then they reach the other end of the hallway and open a door. And that's a one take. They do that as a one take. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, and I am not very familiar, but I know enough about movie making to know this, uh, one takes are something a director does to show off. Uh, they, they show off, like, how cool and coherent a scene is, or, like, how well choreographed a stunt scene is, or, like, man, it really makes a character seem more competent or cool that they pull off this entire scene fluidly without a single cut, or at least a single cut that we can see. So, like, every season of Daredevil has a one take that they almost, like, film the entire episode around, where they let Daredevil, like, fight his way through a series of bad guys. And the thing is, those one takes are not like perfect one takes. They are, they use a lot of in-camera tricks. Like they swap out Matt for his stuntman a few times and stuff like that. But they produce the effect of a single linear, smooth, well choreographed fight. And they are very hard to pull off. There's a lot of technical things that need to go on behind the scenes that make them work. And they do that for the character's introduction in Valerian. And the problem with the one takes is they are incredibly hard on the actors compared to almost any other kind of scene. Because the unit of, like, information an actor needs to memorize for any given scene is, like, their lines, the blocking, and then, like, between takes it can be like, oh, refresh, you know, just check out the script, or, like, the director might shuffle you over a little bit. You know, you have time to adjust. You can do another read. Especially if it's, like, camera A, camera B stuff, it's, like, you can get, like, four or five different reads on a specific, like, sentence, and then they'll just cut in which one they like the best. But if the character is doing a one-take, the actor needs to memorize and nail the entire blocking of what they're going to do, how they're going to move through the scene, and every line they're going to deliver. And that's harder. And if they don't have enough rehearsal, or they aren't necessarily experienced enough, you can hear that they're focusing on hitting the right beats, that they're focusing on getting to the point in the blocking they need to get and getting the line out without stumbling. And that is to the detriment of their ability to actually perform as the character. And this is the intro of this character. Uh-oh, stream lagging a little bit? You guys good? Hmm. Well, my Wi-Fi is pretty solid, so there's not a whole lot I can do about that on my end. Uh, let me just make super sure nothing is wrong. Um, <clears throat> <sighs> okay. Most people are saying they are good. Network's online and secure and protected, but is it contained? Um, yeah, I mean, we should be okay. Uh, all right, sorry. Anyway, um, huh. so basically, the fact that they make these characters basically introduce themselves, endear themselves to the audience in a one take means that we are getting probably their absolute weakest performance at the time where they are also having to sell like two straight minutes of exposition in which there is almost no hint of characterization. And it, I mean, it's just incredibly painful. And then, like, at every point after this, like, we get little hints of characterization. We get some cute moments, even. But they haven't made us understand or like these characters. It just kind of, like, washes over you like a wave, and then you forget about it. And it's like, oh, yeah, he's got, like, nine fucking years of military record? How the fuck does that work? Um, and... <laughs> I mean, that's far from the only problem in the movie, but it is pretty indicative of things to come. Um, and the thing is, like, on paper, a one-take shouldn't be impossible to for the actors to nail, because as a few people in chat are commenting on, it's basically the equivalent of doing it as, like, a stage production, you know, where you have to memorize all of... Okay, the, the, mem the movie I'm discussing is Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Uh... <laughs> I'd put it up on the, the projector, but I don't think we're going to be on this subject for much longer. 
Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, so basically it, it would be the equivalent of like performing it on stage where you have to get all the blocking right and all the lines right anyway. But there's a few other factors. Among other things, you're moving around a camera crew and a microphone crew and a lot of other people running the technical side of things behind the scenes. And they need to be moving around as the camera moves in a way that they are never seen in shot. So it's significantly more complicated to arrange than a theater production. And the actors have a lot more to keep track of than if they were on theater, where they're like on a stage where they might have the opportunity to like improvise a little more or kind of wibble around or take another line a little bit differently at a different pace. It's a lot. Um, it was just a baffling directorial decision. Like you do a one take to show off, but what they showed off was bad and they probably shouldn't have done it like that. Uh, and there's also just a really funny bit right at the end of the movie where they're like, we're going to fix the thing. We have uh, MacGuffin A and MacGuffin B, and we have given MacGuffin A to these people who need both of them. And uh, now we are going to hand over MacGuffin B. And then Valerian all of a sudden is like, whoa, 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 hold on, Loreline. We can't do that. I am, I'm a soldier. I follow orders. I'm, I'm super lawful good. We absolutely cannot do this. And for context, it is important that everybody know that not five minutes prior, he punched his highest commanding officer in the face for learning that the guy was, like, bad and, like, covered up a war crime. So... It's just really fucking funny. It's like these characters aren't even consistent within the same scene. So the movie's really bad, which is baffling because the setting is incredibly well done and intricate. Um, also, the best character in the movie is the shapeshifter named Bubble, played by Rihanna, who is in the movie for basically like one 10 minute sequence. <laughs> um, and I shit you not, she is killed uh, as soon as they transition into the next scene. She dies uh, or she reveals. <laughs> I believe the exact phrasing is she says something like, I must have been injured in the fight. And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess you must have because you're dying now because the movie doesn't need you anymore. So you must have been stabbed in that last fight, even though we didn't see it happen. Uh, my personal theory is that she was just like, I got to get out of this fucking movie. Oh, I must have been injured. Remember me. <laughs> Shapeshift into like Nefertiti and then dissolves into sand. And then like as soon as she gets out of sight, is like, Woof, okay, let's get out of here. <laughs> so that's my theory. But um, again, it's baffling that a movie with so many good ideas in it can be so generally unpleasant. And like, it's not even good ideas poorly executed. All the world building is incredibly good. It's just the two main characters. It feels like like a game campaign setting and we're following the two most boring like i am a human fighter i am also a human fighter and just i don't know i don't know i'm always baffled by bad movies because they're bad <sighs> um okay uh let's see <clears throat> sorry i'm just keeping a track of chat to see if there's anything interesting happening um best romantic relationship that got me invested yeah there was a tumblr ask about this the other day actually and i really struggled to come up with good answers which was kind of depressing um but the uh answer that i forgot about until later and i had to reblog with was i really like the romantic subplot in the 1999 mummy movie i didn't think i would but I think it's really cute. And I think the moment that sold me on it uh, is that one bit where um, Rick, like, steals a tool set from, like, one of the Americans and, like, gives it to Evie as a present and is just, like, like trying to play it cool but is clearly kind of, like, flustered. <laughs> He's a little, like, what are you looking at as soon as he, like, leaves? And I was just like, oh, no. He's adorable. Because <laughs> uh, I... Obviously, I was endeared to Evie almost immediately because she's absolutely adorable. Um, and I think the bit where I, I liked her side of their dynamic is when they're on the boat and, like, bullets are flying and he's, like, sort of casually trying to reload. And, like, there's that bit where, like, the bullet holes are getting blown in the wall and they're getting closer and closer to him and Evie's the only one who noticed. And she, like, kind of, like, grabs him by the shirt and, like, pulls him out of the way. Because <laughs> um, that was when I was like, oh, no, she's adorable. But then after that point, it was just very cute. And obviously there's the bit where they're at the fire together and she's super drunk and she's like, what's a girl like me? Sorry, what's a place like me doing in a girl like this? And he's like, yeah, something like that. And it's just very cute. Um, 
And I guess just like lacking in enough red flags that I normally see or like tedious romantic subplots meant to disrupt it. Like they never add a love triangle and they never do like a contrived misunderstanding. And, you know, they don't immediately skip straight to, oh, we're making out. And uh, it turns out we've actually been in love the whole time, you know, shit like that. Uh, I don't know. It just it skips over a lot of the um, romantic subplot shorthand or romantic subplot insert for easy conflict like plot tokens that tend to kind of turn me off of a lot of those and it was very cute so the movie's good and uh everybody should watch it and you know what else you should watch the 2017 mummy movie (laughs) that is abysmal (laughs) i mean everyone knew it was going to be bad because the trailer like as a bad omen like the trailer got released with half the audio tracks missing and it was so funny, like like half the soundtracks were missing and you could really clearly tell where they like duplicated, like they, they, they took like the same scream sound effect and they stacked it twice in a row because they didn't have enough and normally it would be covered by like really bombastic music. And it's just, oh man, like obviously that wouldn't be enough to make the movie bad, but the movie was also bad. So in hindsight, just so funny. Um, and I think I might have seen that movie before I saw The Mummy 1999, you know, the good one. Uh, so I didn't recognize what parts of the movie were trying to be, like, cheeky references to the original. But the one thing I will say is that the protagonist of The Mummy 1999, who is Tom Cruise playing basically Tom Cruise, seems to be going for, like, kind of roguish Han Solo type with a heart of gold and just comes across as, like, an absolute dick but I don't think we were supposed to think that. And uh, the problem is if you have like a roguish heroic protagonist and, you know, he gets up to some shenanigans, there's a lot of entertainment to be derived from him kind of playing off the characters around him. But if he's just an asshole and nobody ever really calls him on it, that's not as fun to watch. So it was like a big miscommunication all around. Um, I did like the mummy in that movie. She was kind of cool. Uh, Russell Crowe was also funny. The other funny thing in that movie is there's a bit where Russell Crowe and Tom Cruise fight. Uh, sorry, Russell Crowe is playing Dr. Jekyll slash Mr. Hyde. Because remember, this was the stealth pilot for the Dark Universe. It was going to get like a million sequels and totally eclipse the MCU. It was going to be great and fantastic. And then this movie was so bad, it killed it dead. Um, and they're like fighting. And he, Russell Crowe says, you are a younger man. Uh... And he's not, (laughs) I think like Tom Cruise is maybe two years older than Russell (laughs) Crowe. And it's like, gosh, I wonder which of these two actors had a hand in writing the script for this movie. (laughs) Anyway, Uh, right. So yes, The Mummy 1999 had a really cute romantic subplot. The Mummy 2017 did not and uh, should not be watched because it's bad, but also should be watched because it's a very interesting case study in how to not adapt an absolutely beloved media franchise that was already an absolute winner back in the 90s. Anyway, um... Oh, oh right, the Invisible Man is sort of not really part of a dark universe, but like, you know, he's... That's not really about the plot of the Invisible Man, the book, you know, it's it's something else. Um... Uh, have I seen the Cuphead show? I haven't. I've also never played Cuphead, but I will talk about Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts because I've seen that crop up a few times. Uh, Kipo is very fun. I will say that when it first came out, uh, I erroneously judged it as, oh, wow, this is the first kids show I've seen in a while that actually kind of feels like it's aimed at kids. I was incorrect in this assessment. (laughs) Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of like, finished watching through Steven Universe Future and um, She-Ra and a lot of other shows that had very intense, like, they were, you know, colorful and they were kind of for kids, but also they had a lot of other shit going on that was really heavy. Uh, And then Akipo starts and it's like, okay, yeah, it's set in like a post-apocalyptic future where like all the animals are mutants and like half the humans live underground and the other half live on the surface in fear of being eaten. But like, Everything's very whimsical and chipper and the, the the soundtrack is very cute and, you know. And then it pulled out the horror. So 
it never really gets to a level of like, well, that's not entirely accurate. It does hit some pretty serious emotional lows, but never in a way where it's like, there's a specific time kind of tonal dissonance that I like a lot that was present in the Teen Titans cartoon, um, which was like, you'd have some episodes where it's like, oh no, Starfire's trying really hard to bake an alien cake. And then the next episode would be like, Robin is haunted by the literal ghost of Slade, physically and psychologically torturing him while his friends look on helplessly. And it's like, well, uh, okay. <laughs> so like, you never knew what you were going to get. And I really like that. And Kipo doesn't quite do that. Uh, Kipo stays tonally quite consistent, but sort of reveals shades of like, yo, what the fuck? Of like abject horror, just like under the surface, uh, which makes sense. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and on the subject of shows where I was like, oh, is this for kids or not? Uh, I also watched both seasons of Centaur World, and I still don't know if I liked it. <laughs> I like the musical numbers. I love them. I love them a lot. Um, a lot of those I just kind of sing to myself because they're bangers. Uh, I still don't know if I like the show, and I don't know if I'm going to rewatch it, but it's, it's like in my head, it's, it's closer to Over the Garden Wall than a lot of cartoons in the same way of like, why is this a musical? I don't understand why it's a musical. I don't mind it. The songs are really good, but it all sort of lends itself to this very surreal tone. But in Central World, all this stuff is actually really happening, whereas in Over the Garden Wall, it's like a, like a, it's like a trippy near-death experience slash purgatory dimension. So it makes sense that it doesn't really make sense. But with Central World, it's like, you've got the real world, and then you've got the cartoon bubble goofy dimension. But you know what we do in the cartoon bubble goofy dimension? We do a deep-seated exploration of the abject physical and psychological horror experienced by a character physically transforming to resemble a cartoon version of themselves. What? So, again, I don't know if it's good. I don't know if I can unironically recommend it to anybody. But, like, the songs are really good, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, man. Uh... It, it kind of is similar to Infinity Train, but Infinity Train more blatantly went dark. Uh, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I mean, Infinity Train started off pretty unafraid to be like, yeah, things are pretty whimsical on this train. We've got corgis and puppies and, like, adorable little robots and life-sucking cockroaches that will physically age you until you die. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, good shit. Love it. Um, and then season two got a little darker, and season three got way fucking darker, and I didn't watch season four, sadly, because I think when they announced season four, they also announced that it would be the final season, and I was like, that's sad, and I just, <laughs> that's as far as I got. I was like, well, I was interested in all these other characters, not really these two goobers, so whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, Infinity Train is, uh, good. And uh, you should probably watch it before HBO Max uh, unpersons it out of existence. So, yes. Um, let's see. Time to drink more of this. Absolutely terrible tea. Here we go. Ah! What are you looking forward to in season two of Arcane? I want Vi and Caitlin to kiss. What else is there to say? Um, I also uh, am interested in seeing Victor actually turn into the bad guy that the League of Legends wiki has spoiled he will become. And I want to see Warwick. I think Warwick is going to be cool. So let's do it. It would also be nice if Jinx got to be happy, but I'll be honest, I think that ship sailed at the end of season one, a little bit before, maybe. I I will say the one thing that continually impresses me about Arcane is that they always avoid taking the easy way to let the characters have conflict with each other. Um, because, of course, you know, anyone watching the show who's even got a halfway passing knowledge of, you know, League of Legends knows at the very least that 
powder slash jinx is not going to end happy and mentally stable and that her and Vi are not going to have the kind of relationship they had when they were kids. And anyone who's done a li- like a slightly further dive into the wiki is going to know that Victor and Jace are not going to stay buds and in fact are going to grow to hate each other. And the fact is, knowing that kind of reframes the story. And like when you go into a story, when you're writing a story and you're like, I need these two characters to hate each other. I need them to fight. There are a lot of ways to do that. You know, like if you want uh, examples for ways that don't really work so hot, Batman v Superman is an excellent bad example of how to make a contrived fight between two people who should be on the same side feel stupid. But if you're watching Arcane and you're like, okay, I know these characters are going to end up on opposite sides. I know they're going to hate each other. You know, you're maybe a little more forgiving if the show is like, oh, we've had a minor misunderstanding. No, we must fight. And, you know, you just kind of let it escalate. And Arcane at every turn doesn't do that. I kept like being like, okay, this is going to be it. This is going to be the part that drives the wedge between these characters that can never be fixed. You know, like... At the end of episode three, when Powder, with the best of intentions, inadvertently causes the deaths of everybody else that Vi cares about, I was like, that's it, okay? That's easy. That's the part where now they're going to be enemies forever. And then they don't do that. They're like, look, that fucking sucked, but, like, I shouldn't have done that either, and, you know, we're sisters, and I care about you, and I'm sorry you had, you, like, turned into this because I wasn't here to help and protect you, and it's like, oh my god, this is so much more heartbreaking, I love it. Um, and at every possible turn, they just continually reaffirm, like, yes, we are on opposite sides, yes, it seems like our philosophies are fundamentally irreconcilable, but we do still love each other, and it's like, wow, that makes this all way worse than if these characters were just acting irrationally to, like, make you know, the story happened. And Jace and Victor, you know, same thing. There are so many things that they could, you know, fight over. So many, like, miscommunications or lie or revealed plots that we could use to drive a a wedge between them. And instead, like, they just keep, you know, saving each other. They keep sort of, like, pushing farther, but then ultimately being like, look, I care about you. And I, I, you know, with Victor, especially when he's doing his sort of, like, transhumanist stuff, it's like, Jace really wants Victor to be okay and, like, survive. And I genuinely feel that if Victor showed up, like, half robot and was like, hey, I'm feeling much better now, Jace would be like, that's fantastic, good buddy. That's awesome. Let's go. You know, like, it will take them work to get to the point where I believe that they are actually going to, like, hate each other. And the show, the first season at least, has kind of proved that it's willing to do the hard work of slowly and carefully mapping out the character arcs to get them where they need to go rather than just sort of shoving them into place and being like, they hate each other now. Oh, we just can't fit. We can't talk this out. Sorry. They hate each other. Bye. So anyway, uh, yes, I'm excited for season two and I hope it maintains the quality they had in season one. And the one thing I kind of hope they don't do is I hope that they don't make Jason Victor hate each other by killing Jace's girlfriend in that explosion that's about to happen at the beginning of season two. Because I think that would be kind of weak, but it would make enough sense that they might actually still do it. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, chat's talking about so many different things. Um, well, I guess I'll drink some more terrible tea while you guys sort out what exactly is going to happen. Ew. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, the thing about Sky was a bummer. I looked her up on the wiki and it's like, oh, she's not from the game? Oh yeah, she's doomed. But I do kind of hope she's part of the core. Um. Oh, let's see. <laughs> well, of course I have to stay hydrated, Ludo History. You keep pointing it out. Um, what? What is there to say about El Dorado? El Dorado's a good movie. Everybody fucking knows it. El Dorado slaps. Um, I've only ever watched four episodes of Stranger Things. <laughs> I I don't know, man. 
I think it's like I've got nothing against the show. Well, okay, that's not true. I have like things about certain forms of gross horror and like body horror uh, that I'm just not a huge fan of. And it seems like they just love doing that. And that kind of means I don't want to watch it. So, you know, that's how it goes. I I also saw the first four episodes like so in such specific circumstances. I was visiting a friend at his college with another friend and it was like three in the morning in this unfamiliar dorm with nothing but insomnia cookies to keep us company. And we like got through the episodes where like the uh, the fuck it, like the Demogorgon thing was like pulling itself out of the wallpaper. And I was like, oh, God, so spooky. And then we had to like sleep. Uh, and then the next day I was like, wow, how refreshing. And I never felt the urge to watch it again. So, you know, it's just sorry. Is chat discussing something to do with Treasure Planet? and or Atlantis the Lost Empire? I'm seeing comments that indicate as such. And that intrigues me. But in the meantime, I'll have more tea while chat catches up. God, this stuff is really vile. Uh, are we just talking about which of those movies is better? Why we gotta pit two bad bitches against each other? I mean, Treasure Planet and Atlantis The Lost Empire are both so good in such different ways. And I feel like each of them has, like, one thing that sort of stymied it on its way to victory. Like, I know, um, you know, a lot of times, like, cult classics are movies that were just good, but, like, the time they were released didn't really work or something like that. But sometimes there's genuinely something where I'm like, oh, no, no, I see why this, like, scuttled it a little bit. Um, and with Treasure Planet, it's the part that everybody forgets because it sucks. It's the annoying robot guy that shows up in Act 3. <laughs> Nobody likes that fucking robot guy. He never shuts up. He's so annoying. And when he does shut up, it's like, oh, good, the movie's serious again. Fantastic. Um, why do we keep drinking the tea if it's so awful? Because it's there, man. It's the same reason people climb Everest. <laughs> I'll conquer it. One tiny thimbleful at a time. Um, and then Atlantis the Lost Empire, uh, mostly solid. I'd say the one thing it's lacking is, like, a proper... Like, it's got an interesting villain. You know, Rourke uh, is very cool, but he's not exactly par for the course in a standard Disney movie. In fact, large swaths of this movie feel like they could have easily been, like, an Indiana Jones-style adventure flick. Like, it didn't have to be animated. And I think the fact is it was sort of being aimed at an audience of people that were expecting a Disney movie. And instead they got a good movie that was completely different than what they were used to from the Disney formula. Not because it had anything wrong with it, but because it was a completely different set of tropes. Oh, God. All right. Switching to coffee. We're switching to coffee. This is really bad. Um, uh, let's see. I mean, you know, Atlantis had just such fantastic uh, character dynamics, but also, like, a shockingly high body count uh, and not a body count that it's easy to sort of forget about or skip over. Like, like in Mulan, where it's like, oh, she triggers an avalanche and it, like, buries a bunch of Huns. But I think if you're a little kid and you watch that, you're not going to assume that the Huns are dead because you maybe don't understand what an avalanche is and how heavy snow can get. So it's like, oh, she sure did get rid of those bad guys efficiently. But then you watch Atlantis, The Lost Empire, and it's like, we have a crew of several hundred brave men and women on these submarines. And then all the submarines sink, and only the protagonists wash up on shore. And it's like, oh, okay. So several hundred people who we saw in the background, like, doing their jobs, just fucking died. All right, cool. So it's not bad, but I think maybe if you're, like, you know, some Disney parent in, like, what, the 90s, early 2000s, and you're taking the, the kitty winks to the theater... And then you have to explain why, like, a giant lobster just absolutely murdered, like, hundreds of people on screen. Maybe you're not going to recommend to all your other, like, friends with parents, friends with kids. 
that they should take the kitty winks to see it too. I don't know. <sighs> Poppy's pretty good though. Yeah, they have a memorial for the crew. Like the characters acknowledge the absolute tragedy that just befell like befell them, and then they're like, "Wow." Such whimsy and wonder. Look at this magical lost civilization we just found. This is great. Let's talk to Leonard Nimoy playing the, like, king or whatever. Woo! Um, and it's just, you know, it's not a bad movie, but there's parts of it that could have maybe been stitched together a little more thematically, solidly. Um, let's see. Prince of Egypt, kind of the same boat. Uh, another cult classic that, uh, Maybe if you're not as familiar with what's going on, is a little bit weird. Um, another movie where, for me, I watched it under such specific circumstances that it's forever indelibly connected in my head with that. Uh, the first time I watched Prince of Egypt was 5 a.m. the morning after I had broken my clavicle. <laughs> and I was, like, tucked up in, like, a reclining chair at my cousin's house because that was the least painful way for me to, like, sleep. Uh, and I had woken up, like hopped up on endorphins and nobody else in the house was awake, obviously. And I didn't want to bother anyone. And I'd like, I had like an iPad to entertain myself with. And I was like, Ooh, Prince of Egypt. <laughs> so, um, and obviously I knew the story of Prince of Egypt because half my family is Jewish. We talk about it every Passover. <laughs> so like I knew what happened. Um, but it was interesting to see it as a movie and I liked the musical numbers and, uh, it certainly wasn't painkillers cause I hadn't taken any, but like something about that, like fresh, just broke a bone buzz really made that movie hit different. <laughs> so, um, good stuff. Anyway, um, you first saw Atlantis while sleeping on a submarine. I think that would have given me nightmares. Um. Oh, man. Okay. Sinbad is an interesting movie I see frequently, like, categorized with these others. And the thing is, I've seen Sinbad, and I remember fuck all about it. I remember Eris, because her design is great. But does anyone remember the name of any of the characters that aren't presumably Sinbad? <laughs> and I'm just inferring that's his name, because it's the title of the movie. <laughs> it's like, they're finding, like a, like, a book, and he's got, like, a like a bestie who's like, don't execute Sinbad. Execute me in his place if he's not back in a week. Yeah, so, I don't know. And I remember there was kind of like a spunky lady who had, like, generic romantic tension with probably Sinbad. Uh, and that's all I got. Did they also sail a boat on sand? That might be the only other thing I remember. Um... Is no one named Sinbad in that movie? <laughs> oh my god, no, what? <laughs> no! <laughs> the one part of my cold read and I fucked it up. That's so funny. <laughs> How did I break my clavicle? I went skiing uh, for the first time. And uh, to date, the last time. It was uh, not, not great. Um, I learned in the ER that uh, it seems like something about like the temperatures that like weekend had sort of put a little thin crust of ice on the ski slopes at sort of unpredictable intervals because they were getting a lot of broken bones in there um and a funny thing i learned about breaking your clavicle is there's not a lot they can do for a broken clavicle like if it's really messed up they could probably go in there with like a little bit of surgery and like you know pin it in place but mine was just kind of like i mean it wasn't great but they were like that'll basically straighten itself out on its own so just like you know it's a completely internal fracture so just you know they they gave me like a it wasn't a splint because there was nothing really to splint uh but it was like a like a wrap that went around my waist and then sort of held my arm close to my stomach because uh the way that i learned a lot about how the muscles and bones of your shoulder are put together from that um basically uh your Clavicle functioning is required for you to move your arm out to the side. So you can move it from the elbow just fine, and you can even move it forward and back a little bit. But in order to sort of lever it out straight to the side, it requires musculature to be anchored there. And I remember that was almost the first thing I noticed when it, uh, when it was broken, because I, well, okay, the process was interesting, because I sort of 
kind of cartwheeled head over heels and just kind of went loose as I was falling. Uh, and when I kind of stopped moving and sort of settled down, uh, the first thing I noticed was that I was feeling dizzy and nauseous and I had just finished a first aid class. So I had learned the symptoms of a concussion and I was like, oh no, I really hope this isn't a concussion. And then I was like, oh no, this probably has more to do with the fact that I can't move my right arm. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we sort of figured it out and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, great, great. It's just a broken bone. Um, which was funny because of course I was visiting my cousin. So we kind of had to call my parents and I was like, okay, hey dad. So please tell mom not to freak out. I am in the hospital. I broke my clavicle. We're getting it sorted. Everything's okay. I feel all right. And like in the background, I could hear my mom being like, what the fuck? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's just like, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Tell her it's okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it was very interesting. I'd never broken a bone before. Uh, the healing process was extremely cool. Uh, <laughs> and I felt bad because, like, I this was senior year of college when uh, you only had to take, like, a minimum of, like, four classes. And we also only had a minimum of three years of gym class. And almost everybody didn't take gym class senior year. But I did. I liked gym class. <laughs> so when I came back, I sort of, like, talked to the teacher for, like, that six-week period uh period which i think was like it, it was like i don't even remember it was like weights or something it was access to an actual stocked gym and i was like hey yeah so you know over winter break i broke my broke my clavicle but like i figure i can like still use the rowing machine or something and he was like what are you talking about take the period off you broke a bone and i was like all right man if you're sure and then i just went and played video games for like the entire rest of the quarter um so that was pretty cool uh what were we talking about <laughs> sinbad <laughs> um <laughs> Anyway, uh, oh, this was in high school, uh, senior year of high, I might have said college, but I meant high school, sorry. Um, yeah, so three years of, you know, standard gym class, and then fourth year, you could take it if you wanted to, uh, and I was like, I've never minded a gym class, and I would rather not have to stack more homework when I could be playing video games in the senior lounge instead, so, uh, yeah, anyway, um, Oh, <sighs> let's see. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> broke a clavicle. Well, I thought maybe I could use the rowing machine one-handed. I don't think I'd ever actually use the rowing machine. <laughs> I just saw it mostly engaged, like, the legs and core. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ludo. I, I met high school, but, you know, once you're out of school, it all kind of blurs together. Uh, yes, we had a senior lounge. Sadly, I believe it's since been demolished, but, oh, it was exquisite. It was an absolute wretched hive. Uh, like, three of the least trustworthy couches one could ever imagine. People had, like, brought in game systems and, like, TVs and just set them up there. Um, oh, boy. Anyway, very fun. Um, <clears throat> uh, are there any pieces you've appreciated for their Jewish representation? You know, I will say that any time a piece of media acknowledges that Kitty Pride is Jewish and that Magneto is Jewish, I appreciate it. And what I want is a story that lets those two hang out. <laughs> X-Men Evolution was good about that. They had like a like a Christmas episode uh, and they went out of their way to show like Kitty at home with her parents lighting a menorah. And I thought that was really cute. Um, and uh, yeah, you wouldn't think it would be a tall ask to keep those canon. But uh, well, you know. Wanda and Pietro Maximov are canonically the children of Eric Lenscher, and the MCU went out of their way to show that uh, Wanda had, like, a cross on her wall for some fucking reason. And it just feels weird, so, you know, it's, it's not a huge deal, but it's the kind of thing you sort of train yourself to look out for, and it kind of makes you a little, a little butthurt to, you know, notice yourself being sort of casually overwritten. Um... Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, the, uh, the thing, like, the Kitty Pride and Magneto thing, here's the thing, I have so many, like, I want these characters to hang out interactions that have happened some places, but I want them to happen more, and one of them is Kitty and Magneto hanging out, because Magneto grew up at a very different time to be Jewish in the States than Kitty did, and that could be kind of interesting, like, a generational discussion, and I want them both to hang out with Captain America, who, lest we forget, fought Hydra and the Nazis and has very strong opinions about that sort of thing. Like, they've done that crossover before. There's a, there's an episode of X-Men Evolution 
where uh, we basically flash back to Wolverine helping Captain America liberate the camp that Magneto was in, uh, which is dope, like pretty fucking wild, actually. Um, And just the kind of thing that I think is easy to gloss over the farther into the future we get. Because, of course, like, when Captain America started, the U.S. wasn't even in World War II yet. Uh, And he's basically been running continuously for, like, the past 80 years. So the timeline has been shifting forward every few decades, Um, which is quite interesting. Uh, I don't know. There's other things I've seen. I also saw, like, uh, I don't know what comic it's from. I only saw a few pages from it. But basically, like, I think it's uh, Iceman, Bobby. uh, For those of you who don't know, it's been canon in the comics for a while that Bobby is gay. Uh, although I think they've changed the way that that got revealed because I know in at least one comic, the way they revealed it is that Jean Grey, who is, of course, a telepath, like, knows he's gay and assumes he knows too and, like, tells him. Uh, anyway, I think they've changed that because they were like, is this bad? This might be bad. Um, anyway, uh, but basically, you know, there's a lot of allegorical stuff with the X-Men, there's a lot of things that they, as a marginalized supernatural group, can stand in for. And basically, it's just this great little bit where Bobby is kind of having, like, his little, like, crisis of, oh, there's something wrong with me. And Magneto's, like, descending on the mansion, like, and now, Charles, you will see there is nothing I, you possess that I, oh, shit, is that a crying child? And, like, goes down and, like, immediately talks it through with him. And I was like, yes, yes. I love it when Magneto is just kind of, like, the bitchy uncle <laughs> who, like, starts fights at the family reunions but ultimately cares deeply about everybody present um ugh. <clears throat> i would like you to talk about warrior cats please i wish i could but i fully missed the boat on warrior cats sorry uh anyway <clears throat> please don't kill your voice i can hear that it's getting pretty tired ah buddy i could do this all day here we go let's get more coffee in me Who's Kitty Pride? Uh, she's the X-Men who can, like, phase through shit. Uh, she's great. And she's, like, best friends with Nightcrawler, and their friendship is absolutely adorable, and it's the best part of X-Men Evolution. And I love that they never get implied to be in a romantic subplot. I think that that's good. Um... Hmm. Oh, yeah, also known by her code name of Shadow Cat, but, like, most people don't actually call her that anymore. She's just Kitty. She's Kitty Pride. Um. Oh, right. <laughs> so, the X-Men movies. I forgot about Have You Tried Not Being a Mutant. But honestly, like, considering it was the early 2000s, which, by today's standards, were still shockingly homophobic, like, kind of impressive that they actually went there. Um, even if they did kind of straight wash Bobby. Anyway... Um, ooh, my thoughts on Moon Knight. Oh, be still my heart. I really enjoyed Moon Knight. Um, I didn't think I was gonna because I was really wary about, here's the thing, dissociative identity disorder, uh, is like one of the most misunderstood and maligned mental health issues ever because I think a lot of writers like heard about it or like read the first two lines on Wikipedia and were like, oh, This is the perfect way to justify a really interesting bad guy. Who doesn't know they're a bad guy? Unprecedented. Nobody's ever thought of this before. And they went with that. So as a result, like, it almost all comes from movies like Split or, you know, really weird interpretations of Jekyll and Hyde. Um, And I was kind of worried. You know, I was a little worried what they were going to do with a protagonist with it. And I was really pleasantly surprised. And I, uh... I kept watching with it, and uh, it was good. Although I will say that Moon Knight, I mean, it peaks in episode five. Like, we all, you know, like all the, all the, oh, the gods or whatever. Like, oh, there's an evil plot to resurrect an evil god, and we're going to have to fight her in a kaiju battle. It's like, that's just, you know, that's whatever. That's, that's there because the MCU needs a giant fight at the end. You know, it's the, it's the evil robot Jeff Bridges effect. But the real finale is episode five when uh moon knight sort of internally works out his shit and it's great and i thought it was really good um moon knight and hawkeye are like the only marvel miniseries i've watched and i really liked hawkeye (laughs) 
in terms of things we're talking about in season two. I want uh, Kate and Yelena to, like, room together. That's all I want. I want Kate to be figuring out how to provide for herself after an entire lifetime of being, like, a spoiled rich kid. And I want them to be the most chaotic roommates ever. And I will accept it if they also smooch, but it's not required for my enjoyment of the show. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's that's the vibe. I haven't seen Loki. Unfortunately, um, I was too invested in the original Loki, the one that they unceremoniously murdered and then replaced with a version that had no character development. And again, it's the multiverse problem. I kind of don't care about the rebooted version, so... <sighs> Uh, let's see. <clears throat> oh, I forgot. Yeah, I also watched WandaVision. Sorry. Uh, and I, I really liked WandaVision. I thought it was good. Um, it's an interesting case where, like, I basically never watched any sitcoms, like, especially not the kinds that those were specifically parodying. So watching the show, I was like, this is great. But I have heard from people who, like, watched and enjoyed those sitcoms that the show doesn't capture what made them work, uh, which is an interesting complaint. Uh, I don't know. I thought it was interesting. You know, I, I keep seeing the question pop up of, like, favorite ace rep. And I genuinely might just not be looking in the right places, but I'm still in the headspace of, like, I don't know. Do you want me to choose between Jughead or that guy from uh, BoJack Horseman because I know there's more but I don't really know who they are uh, or like you know there's like Ace Rep and podcasts and, and like self-published things and web comics certainly um, and there's characters that I think are Ace or the equivalent like like you know Peridot from Steven Universe the way she's like I never want to fuse and that's okay is like well, that's not exactly the same thing, but it's, like, clearly allegorically the same thing. Um, Luffy is a good example. Luffy definitely counts. Data would count, except that they make him bone in episode two enthusiastically. <laughs> so he's definitely in the headspace of, like, he should be ace, and the reason he's not is an authorial oversight. But that doesn't mean I get to necessarily call him my favorite ace rep, you know? Um... Oh, and Lilith from the Owl House. I do like her. I think her arc has been absolutely fascinating. And what I really like about the Owl House is that not a single character has been like, you don't deserve redemption. They're all just really, like, kind and accepting and generous of her. And like, okay, as long as you stop being actively, like, a problem, we're going to welcome you back with open arms. And I think that... um. It's an approach to redemption arcs that I don't often see, where it usually feels like at least one character needs to, like, quote-unquote, hold them accountable, uh, or something like that. And in this case, I just kind of like how it's like, yeah, you fucked up bad, and you've been trying to fix it in, like, worse ways, but now that you're on the mend, we're all cool, actually. Uh, and I like that a lot. I really do. The Owl House is very good. Okay. Uh... I think we're going to say maybe 10 more minutes. I mean, I'd say five, but that would still take us over the four hour mark. So, you know, may as well. Um, <clears throat> but yes, that way I will be able to down the rest of this absolutely revolting tea and, uh, I don't know, transcend to a higher plane of existence or something. I don't know what this stuff is going to do to me. Uh, okay, I also saw... Either several people asking or one person asking very persistently. I have not watched Gendy Tartakovsky's Primal. I've seen a few clips from it, but as mentioned, I sort of have an upper limit for how much, like, nonverbal storytelling and just cool fights with no context I'm willing to watch. And it's, uh, not as high as I thought it was. Uh, so, like, Samurai Jack is the right balance for me, or at least the first, you know, before we got to season five. Um... But Primal is a little too much uh, for me. You know, it's 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 Gendy at his most pure, but I prefer him at like a 90 to 85 percent, you know? Um, let's see. Of course I've watched Megamind. Megamind slaps. Everybody should watch it. <laughs> it's really good. Um, ah, uh, Spy X Family, I've read the manga for. 
and it's very good. And I'm glad that it's getting a manga version or an anime version that everybody sees and likes uh, because it's extremely cute and I cannot wait to see this House of Cards absolutely topple because, I mean, you know, it's it's a classic liar revealed story. It's like, oh, we've got we got three characters. All of them are concealing secrets. Only one of them is aware of the secrets of the other two. Okay, how long can we possibly maintain this? And it's like, that's sort of... Well, that's what's essentially maintaining the tension, which I think is very interesting. Like, as they build a more and more pleasant status quo, we become increasingly aware of how precarious it is. Uh, so everyone being like, oh, it's so cute. I absolutely love their family dynamic is like, they're sort of like underneath them the like, uh, you know, the overlaid meme image of like, oh no. <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, I'm excited. I think it will be cute. Uh, and it also does some very interesting like character stuff and real political commentary stuff. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thoughts on Usagi Yojimbo? Okay, that's bait. It's good. Everybody should read it. Um, <laughs> it's uh. It's a great black and white comic uh, that's basically like, hey, what if we had a Kurosawa-style wandering lawful good protagonist doing, like, heroics in the world, but also he was a rabbit in a world of, like, anthropomorphic animals. And, yeah, let's do it. It's really, really fun, and the, uh, co the comic fight choreography is incredible. If you're interested in making comics, like, Usagi Ojimbo definitely had an impact in sort of passively teaching me how comics can be put together. And it's got a very fun secondary, like, rotating cast. Because it's kind of an anthology series. Like, Usagi will just, like, wander into different neighborhoods and, like, run into new weirdos and hang out with them or whatever. Uh, there is kind of the question of, like, is there going to be an overarching plot at any point? Like, there were a couple story arcs semi-recently where I was like, it would be kind of interesting if they did this thing that would completely overturn the status quo with this specific character. And uh, they did not do that. They did the thing... That wasn't that instead. And I was like, I understand why, but now I'm not entirely sure what the point of this was. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Sorry, just... Uh... <laughs> you still workshopping on making an urban fantasy setting comic something? You haven't spoken a lot about it. I love the concept of urban fantasy so much that I do want to do something with it, but I've had a lot of false starts, and I think that's not a problem. It's, you know, it's the sort of thing you sort of experiment with and, and have fun with on the way, and then you find something that you are actually passionate about doing with it. Um, so for a while I had a comic, and then it sort of just dissolved into I had a bunch of characters, but nothing really to do with them. And then I scrapped all that, and then I had a different character and sort of the possibility of a bunch of stories about that character. Uh, I started toying with the idea of essentially doing like a, like a private investigator who is a werewolf. Um, because why the fuck not? Uh, and that of course opens up the opportunity for a lot of like little short mysteries and stories. And I wrote one of those and then I ran out of mysteries. <laughs> Uh, and then I constructed a much larger mystery for this character to be involved in, and I got about seven plot twists deep before I thought, I think this is spiraled out of control, and I left it alone. So it's clearly still in the workshopping phase, like the little little goblins in my brain are still like hammering over it on the forge before it prevents, like presents me with anything I can, I can do with it. Uh, thanks for getting that spammer before I, I did. Um, have you seen Strong Female Protagonist? Okay, I want to recommend that, actually. Uh, Strong Female Protagonist is a webcomic, I want to say co-written by Brennan Lee Mulligan of College Humor and Dimension 20. And I read through the entire thing up to where it was currently at at the time. I don't know if it's updated since then. And it's really interesting. It's like a... It's a very, I'd say, deep dive into certain elements of Brennan Lee Mulligan's, like, internal philosophy that I thought was quite cool. Uh, and it had a, an interesting explanation for a Superman-like power set uh, that I thought was neat. So it wasn't going to be the wolf among us because my werewolf detective was going to be a lesbian. So that's very original. <laughs> I don't know. I just think there aren't enough, like, lady werewolves, you know? I think that I think we deserve more lady werewolves. It's a natural combination, you know? It's like, what are two demographics that I commonly associate with flannel? <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to stop talking about this. 
before somebody bullies me into writing the whole thing before it's good. Anyway, uh, yes, I've watched A Court of Fae and Flowers. It's good. Everybody else should watch it, too. Um, the comic is called Strong Female Protagonist. It's a little difficult to Google, but you can find it. Um, oh, my God, guys. You got to slow down or at least chill out a little bit. Um, uh, Kurosawa, Yojimbo. Yeah, I watched Yojimbo and Sanjuro. Uh, they're good. It's interesting. Um, I think Sanjuro is the one that originated the, uh, like the high pressure blood thing where you have like the two samurais and they're like staring each other down. And then one of them like does the draw the sword and sheath it again so fast you can't even see it. And then the other guy like explodes. Uh, that's almost entirely because of an effect in Sanjuro that sort of went a little too right. Like, they had, like, a like a blood pump, and they sort of overcalculated the pressure. So, like, he's supposed to just bleed, but instead it's just like, psh, uh, and then he falls over, and they're like, don't ruin the take, don't ruin the take. So from that point forward, everyone was like, wow, high-pressure blood is awesome. So it's all thanks to Sanjuro. Um, let's see. <sighs> um oh boy guys uh what do you think of sherlock holmes as ace rep i love to headcanon that way i think it's completely reasonable and you can read into it from the original text that way uh i don't feel comfortable calling him canon ace rep because i fully don't think that arthur conan doyle was thinking about that stuff. I think there was a certain archetype he wanted Holmes to fulfill, which did not at any point involve any sort of romantic entanglement, and that's as far as that went in his head. Uh, I think that historically, uh, this speech might be a little longer than the one minute I have left before my artificial 10-minute uh, time limit. I think historically there have been there's been an awareness of a lot of different demographics that we now have names for that people didn't think of having names before. So, like... For instance, the archetype of like, oh, you know, she's like, uh, she's like a spinster, you know, she's, she's like 40 and unmarried and, uh, you know, just has like cats or whatever, or like nieces or nephews. Um, and it's like, <clears throat> you know, there are all kinds of reasons why that could be true. Or like, oh, these girls would like, they'd go to a nunnery and they just stay there forever and they'd never get married. Oh, how could they possibly stand it? Well, maybe some of them didn't want to get married. Maybe some of them wanted to be somewhere with... Lots of young women. I don't know. There's a lot of reasons. Or, like, uh, th these ladies, like, chopped off all their hair and ran away to sea and dressed up like boys for the rest of their lives. It's like, oh, I can think of a few reasons why someone might do that. Um, uh, and, you know, even as recently as then, it's like, oh, this is a care. This is like a, he's, you know, he's a, he's a perma bachelor. Never really seems interested in women. Always seems too busy. All kinds of reasons that could be the case. Um... And the awareness of the diversity of human experiences and characterization has long predated specific labels for all those things. And I think it's not too much of a stretch to look at characters written in time periods before, perhaps we had a strong understanding of a lot of that stuff, and be like, just from the way this character acts, it makes sense to me if this character matches what we understand now as this thing. Uh, for instance, if you read any Sherlock Holmes novel now, you're like, this man has the worst case of undiagnosed, self-medicated ADHD I've ever seen. But Arthur Conan Doyle wouldn't know any of those words. Least of all, unmedicated. <laughs> so, um, anyway, all that to say, I think that uh, it's a little bit difficult to be like, this character is categorically this thing. But it is very reasonable to be like, to me, this character makes sense perfectly as this thing. Um... I just don't feel comfortable being like, this is my favorite bit of canon rep, because if we're specifying canon rep, it's like, eh, yeah, I don't know. Well, he never says the word because it doesn't exist yet. Anyway, uh, thank you all so much for joining in. I am astounded we didn't really drop below 1,800 viewers at any point, considering this was just me shooting the shit for four hours, seven minutes, and 37 seconds to date. Uh, but, uh, you know, thank you all very much for tuning in. Uh, and also... For the 2 million subscriber milestone that we probably, I probably could have mentioned earlier in the stream. I think it slipped my mind. Uh, we are going to have a video out tomorrow in about, you know, 11 hours. Uh, sort of like a, a little celebratory, commemorative, like, hey, this was cool kind of dealio. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> thanks for, for tuning in. I'm going to drink the rest of my tasty coffee and my absolutely terrible ginger tea. Uh, and I will catch you guys the next time I do one of these bad boys uh, with a lot more media takes or perhaps a slightly more organized list of some kind. Um, I'm continually amazed that you guys actually like watching these. Like, this is just my brain, like, switches off, like, <laughs> removes the restraints on my hyperfixation info dumps and just, like, lets it rip. <laughs> Revengeance style. So anyway, I will uh, catch y'all the next time I do one of these things uh, or the next time we have a slightly more reasonable stream with, like, more people on it to keep me in check. Uh, and until then, I will see y'all later. Bye, everybody. <laughs>